Any second now. Any second now. Any second now. All right, cool. We're live. Hi. Okay. Uh, music. Hi. Uh, so I was a little late because of a spaghetti coma. Then I had to explode the toilet. Uh, it happened to the best of us. <laughs> it happens uh, to the best of us. I did see people posting while the stream hadn't started. Like, wait, why isn't the stream live yet? Is everything okay? Did she post something on Twitter about it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask questions you're not prepared to get the answers to. <laughs> Admittedly, Holly says all this as if I was not also late without any excuse. <laughs> you had an excuse. I had no excuse and you know this. <laughs> hey now. Do not, <laughs> Do not try and cover for me. I was disassociating, staring at the computer screen, writing fucking smile for me fanfiction while I have three weeks worth of journal entries to write for class. I don't know, that's an excuse. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> and also, I love you. I love you. <laughs> butter. It's butter time. Oh, we're doing butter tonight. Uh. What if you ate some butter? Do you think that would help me? What's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get attacked. <laughs> hey, Holly, want to know something completely unrelated? That's really scary. Please tell me. <laughs> I, I just turned around because I was like kind of glancing at the fridge trying to think like, oh, what do I have that's not butter that I could eat at some point? Like, what could I have that's an actual meal? And I noticed that apparently a sticker came off of my glasses case and is now just dangling hilariously from Spamton's nose. Awesome! <laughs> Spamton is famous for that sticker that he has. <laughs> it, I literally had to do like a double take. God, that's so fucking funny. Of all the places for it to end up. Of all the places. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just typing out uh, announcements and stuff. No worries. Uh, I think that's everything. I think. I think I told everyone everywhere. Oh, that's a really good fucking picture. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh... So how's everyone doing today? Hope you're having a good one. It's uh Sunday. I so the time change happened, and so I woke up first of all to that. Uh, but my brain was in like the hyperbolic crime chamber. So I thought, oh shit, it's ten o'clock. I'm waking up at ten o'clock. It was it was eight. <laughs> it was eight. It was fully eight o'clock. Uh, and I was like, oh, this, that's a fucking relief. Okay. Uh, and then I was like, wait, why are, like, my parents home and up and not working? And I realized it's it's not Monday. It's it's, it's Sunday. It's, it's not a weekday. <laughs> Holly time traveled against her will. I I got jettisoned, like, into the next fucking day. That's how that's how much I slept like a fucking rock. And I was just like, oh, God, what year is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I literally, like, woke up, thought, oh, God. God, I must have slept through my alarm. Or no, no, that wasn't it. What happened was I woke up and was getting like a billion texts. I was like, oh God, something's wrong. It was just that my, my friend was texting me and hadn't looked at the time. So I was like, <laughs> okay, well, what time is it? And I discovered today, cause you know, I'm, I'm in a new apartment now. So I discovered that um, except for my phone and computer, all the clocks here uh, have to be changed manually. Ah. So I looked at the clock that was like on my, my, my microwave and was like, oh shit, I overslept. And then I looked at my phone and went, wait, no, it's that devil daylight savings time. <laughs> well, okay, I got like a whole other hour before I need to be up, I can go to sleep. And then my sweet darling baby kitty, who saw me sit up and like look at the time and to her thought, oh, it's well past wake up time because she's she does not know the crime that is daylight savings. Right. Saw me sit up, kind of 
amble like I was gonna get up, look at my phone, and go back to bed, and was fucking devastated. <laughs> <laughs> Just running around like, ah, ah, ah. Mother, you fiend, you cad! <laughs> How could you do this to sweet baby kitty? Lola was also, uh, really unhappy <laughs> about, uh, the time changes. She was, like, howling, uh, with desperation and rage as much as, as, much as a little cat can muster, I reckon. I just like, why aren't you feeding me? Why aren't you feeding me? It's time for food. It's time for to get fed. Why, why aren't you feeding me? Not happy about it. Really not happy about it. Uh, so she got fed, like, a little bit early at, like, 3.30 instead of 4 o'clock. Uh, so good for her. Uh, hang on a second. I had to pull up, uh, uh, control F to search for something so that I could Gustave play. Gustave de Laval. Uh, on command, so I could just hit you with a... Gustave de Laval. Whenever you need it. We got that stuff on tap. You know we got that. Gustave de Laval. Ready to go, frothing up your mug. You're so thirsty for it. You're so thirsty for a nice, cold, fresh. Gustave de Laval. And I know it. And you know it too. Damn, it is only playing. Uh. Well, that's why it's only playing Dicey Dungeons music so far. It's because I didn't hit the shuffle button. That'll do it. That'll do it. <laughs> Assign Dicey Dungeons at Butter. I was like, damn, it really wants to play the ominous Dicey Dungeons music tonight right before Butter stream. That's funny, but why is it doing that? And it's like, oh, it's because I didn't hit the button that makes it not do that. I see. I see. <laughs> I get it. I understand. Uh, it was real fucking hot yesterday. It was like a goddamn swamp in here. I was, uh... Oh, yeah. Is it cooler today, at least? Uh, marginally. Uh, to the point where, like, uh, I have my... I had to have my little AC unit running yesterday just so it could be, like, bearable temperature. Today I have it running just because it's, like, humid and raining, so it's, like, on dehumidifier mode right now. Uh... Mm -hmm. But, like, I can actually, you know, have it on and off periodically instead of it has to be running for hours, which is good! That's certainly better! At least there is that! And, like, tomorrow it is immediately cooling back down to, like, fucking five or six degrees, so it's like... What the hell going on? It's like this this weird, like, hot pocket just drifted over for, like, a day or two. Hot pocket! And, like, you were t t What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Why did you make a song out of it? <laughs> Hot Pocket Jingle! What? <laughs> I don't know what that means! Like Hot Pockets, like the food! <laughs> what? Do they not have those in Canada? <laughs> Hang on, I'm, pr I'm like 90% sure I know what a Hot Pocket is, but like I've never seen them for sale, so I've never heard a fucking commercial for them. Uh... We got shit like this, but, uh, I've never seen, like, one in store, so I've never heard an ad for one. I see. Oh god, a Hot Pocket is kind of just a calzone, it's isn't it? South buttered noodles for the butter street. Little bit. I need to go to hell now. Bye. They, they exist in Quebec? I've never fucking seen one. I've literally never seen one. You're lying to me. You're doing a trick on me. I can't believe you would trick the streamer on her own stream. That's disgusting. You're all going to hell. I know what a hot pocket is. <laughs> I don't need that part explained. <laughs> what was I saying before I before that? <laughs> I something about the weather, hot pockets. Oh right, it's fucking weather. It was like cold over where you lived, wasn't it? Or like relatively yeah, at it's least. Fine. It's finally cooling off. Like we're we're finally getting the quote unquote fall weather, by which I mean kind of like a pleasant early to mid spring weather. <laughs> Oh, I was so jealous of that yesterday. Just wanted to emphasize the stink and smell and fart vibes. I don't know what that is. Never say that to me again. <laughs> Never say these words in my chat room again. Uh, the, the Twitch machine is saying an ad is about to start. Hopefully it actually will this time. Um... 
I'm waiting so patiently to see if it'll actually run the ad this time when I hit the button to make it do it. Uh, any second now. Hey, let's fucking go! It actually does what I'm telling it to. Uh, so. At long last. Uh, if you're still hearing me, hello. It either means, uh, you have a sub or you have an ad blocker. Either way, it means you're really fucking smart. So welcome. <laughs> Uh, I drink my tea. Tea. Or you're psychic? I don't know about that one. Wait, I mean, you could totally still just see, like, subtitles, probably. Because I think it, like, shoves the little, the little, the little window of the stream, like, in the corner so you can still see that part. So you're not missing too much, I suppose. <laughs> we are just sat here. We, we are just still kind of sitting here, though. <laughs> <sighs> I'm trying to think of if there's anything wacky I can talk about before we get started. Uh, I guess I posted about it briefly on uh, Twitter. I was playing a bit of Deep Rock Galactic this morning, uh, as I am wont to do lately, because I like that game. Um, and I got a mission where it's just like, okay, so there's a big tank and it's got a drill on it. You have to escort it. Uh, you think the dwarves from DRG would drink butter? They would. They fucking would, and it's disgusting, but they would. Uh, and so it was like, all right, so you, you got a big tank. It's got a drill on the front. You got to escort it through the cave. Then you get to, like, a, an objective at the end, and then you got to defend it. Uh, and it stops every now and then because it's got to refuel. Um, and so I got to, I got a mission where it was, like, the maximum length, so you have to do two stops, and then you get to the objective. So I got to my second stop, I put the oil in it, and I'm like, all right, cool, perfect. Now I just gotta power her up, and it's like right clean to the uh to the objective, right? And so, uh the tank is affectionately called Doretta by the dwarves, and I swear to god, Doretta just like barked like a dog, did a 180, started going backwards, made a complete circle around the entire map, and then started flying. She just started hovering in midair. <laughs> After Loretta is going to heaven. <laughs> No, literally, one of my fucking friends, after I, like, posted about this, just posted at me and went, Doretta go heaven now. And I am <laughs> thinking about Doretta go heaven now all day. <laughs> Doretta go heaven now. Doretta go heaven now. I literally spent half of that mission just waiting for the tank to finish going back through the map and then back through it a second time. I guess a third time, technically. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like, finally beat the fucking mission and I was like, alright, well, all of that weird faffing abouts happened. What if I stay for just, like, a little bit longer? Um, and, you know, just, like, get a bunch of gold or whatever. Three of the giant exploding dudes spawned and started chasing after me, so I was like, no, I'm going. I'm going home. Bye. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just walk out. You can leave. Oh. Uh, <laughs> if it sucks, go to heaven. <laughs> oh, planets, if you're quick. <laughs> <sighs> Only seen them a few times and they scare you so bad. I assume you mean the bulk debt. Oh, I have a fucking story about the bulk detonators when I was playing with, uh, friends of the stream. Uh, it was Sign, Osk, and Meadow, and Bomber, and we were, like, uh, switch switching in and out, like, who was doing, it, like, what and when kind of thing. Also, S Serpy was there for a little bit, but they just, like, came to say hi. Um, we had- it, it was supposed to just be- <laughs> A simple mining mission. <laughs> just to get... Just like the basic ass go here. Mine shit. Go home. Um, and we had a bulk detonator. And like, you know, that's not nothing unusual on its own. Uh, and then like a swarm happened basically immediately afterwards. And then a second fucking bulk detonator happened. And... <laughs> I swear to fucking God. Um... Like, while we're, like, besieged by everything else and, like, you know, the bulk is also there. We have to be mindful because we're already fighting in a crater that the first one made. And we have to, like, watch out because it's like, all right, well, the second one's about to make a fucking crater. So everyone's got to try and stay safe. 
uh, Maddo falls to the floor and gets bit by, like, 30 dudes and drops dead. And it's like, oh, shit, we, we gotta go get Maddo. Um, and everyone's like, all right, so we can just, like, back off and stay safe. And then we can, you know, shoot the, shoot the bulk detonator and then go pick them up. Uh, no one had a clean shot on it. Uh, so I just go, all right, I'm fucking going in. I'm going to intervene. <laughs> so I fucking sprint off the cliff. <laughs> Power attack the bulk detonator in the face with my pickaxe. Uh, and then it, right before it's about to go fucking thermonuclear <laughs> and take my life out with one wicked strike, I run over to Maddo and put a shield up and I just start fucking howling. <laughs> and I need you to know I did this and had no idea if the shield was actually going to protect me from the explosion. It did. It does. I did science that day. <laughs> Everyone was just fucking losing their minds, and I think in the heat of the moment, I just screamed something like, I am braver than God! <laughs> DRG is fun. I like that game. It's, uh, one of my favorite horde shooter type games. <laughs> yeah! Sign, I was not expecting it to really work, but I was like, well, it's worth a fucking shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Phil Kep, for the resub. Mario. Much appreciated. I'm just going to wait for this song to finish up and then I can play the proper intro and we can, you know, actually get started. Uh, but I guess mm. while we're just sitting around and doing talk and I guess I can do the normal intro stuff, you know, welcome to the stream. Thanks for tuning on in. I hope you're having a good day so far. Um... If you're new to the channel, or if you're not, you know, review the rules, get a refresher on those, try to make the chat the best possible experience for yourself and everyone else here, and also me. Um, if you want to support the stream, you know, subs, tips, bits, all that stuff. Never mandatory, no obligation, but, uh, you know, greatly appreciated all the same. Uh, it's because of the very generous support uh, of viewers like you that I'm able to do this, you know, as often as I do while also still being able to pay off bills and things like that. Uh, so thank you all very much for that. It, all, it always means a whole lot to me. Uh, what else? What else? You know, you know, you can always tell a friend about the stream if you're looking for a way to help out the stream. What don't cost you a dime. You can share posts about the stream on... I mean, I mostly just post about it on Twitter, but you can talk about it wherever the hell you want, I guess, as long as you're not breaking any rules. Uh, Twitter, huh? Yeesh, tugging my collar. <laughs> Uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, or, you know, if you, if you have the time uh, and you like what's going on, tuning on in, having a good time, that's support in its own way, so thanks for taking time out of your busy day to spend it here with us. Uh, that's all the normal intro stuff out of the way. Uh, we're gonna be doing butter today. Oh, it's butter. Uh, I guess I can get that preamble out of the way while I play, uh, the intro song, but, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I think? I reckon it was a couple of weeks by this point. Um, I said I was doing Butter Stream, and it was just me reading the Wikipedia article for Butter, and then I was reading a list of Butter dishes on Wikipedia. Uh, and then I got like partway through that, and I was too fucking tired, and I was like, uh, I can't do this tonight. I gotta do this some other time. We gotta do this another day. Uh, and so another day is here. And so we're going to finish the list of butter dishes. <laughs> Get it over with. <laughs> Soon we will be free. At long last. If you missed the first stream, is there any plot you missed? I mean, you can go read the Wikipedia article about butter if you want to know some hot butter facts. <laughs> it's, you, you gotta brush up on your butter lore. It's crucial. It's, 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 it's a public resource. It's right there. <laughs> All you gotta know... Uh, is there was a hot Dutch bitch named Gustav de Laval. I don't actually remember if he was Dutch or not. Uh, Swedish, sorry. He's he's from Sweden. Uh, and his name was... I hit play and it didn't play. Anyways, his name was... Gustav de Laval. And he was so fucking good at butter uh, that he made it have anything. And he invented uh, steam turbines also. But he didn't invent them. He made important contributions to the design of them. And also, his name is Gustave de Laval, and that's the most important thing you need to know. And his name sounds like this. Gustave de Laval. Don't ever forget it, uh, or you'll Gustave never know how to pronounce it. 
Gustave de Laval. He was really good at butter and turbines, and for that we're all so thankful for him. Uh, what else? There's a lot of dishes made of butter. Thank you, Detective Rocco, for the tip. Please give me a Gustave de Laval, bartender. Coming right up! Gustave de Laval. Hope you enjoy! <laughs> I suppose if you want to pay me money for me to hit the Gustave de Laval button, I'm game. I can do that. <laughs> I think we should do this. I think people should pay for the benefit of Gustave de Laval and also just give you money in general because I love you and you deserve it. <laughs> I love you too. I love you. First stream you've caught live after watching many VODs? Uh, well, thank you for tuning in and... Uh, apologies and or congratulations that your first one you're watching live is just me reading about butter on Wikipedia, but... <laughs> Welcome! Wonderful to have you here. Uh, this is... Gonna be at least a little cut and dry, but I hope you have a lot of fun, uh, hearing all about... Uh, list of butter dishes. From Wikipedia. Uh, the free encyclopedia. Actually, hang on, before we do that, I gotta play the music. Uh, and then I have to screen share to my partner. All my homies. Hi, that's me. Uh, that's you. you. Just a second. Uh, here, here. Okay, you can see it. Hey, thank you to Shipper's yeah. Calligrapher for the raid. Hope you had yourself a wonderful stream. Uh, you are here, just in time. For list of butter dishes. From Wikipedia. The free encyclopedia. This is a list of notable butter dishes and foods in which butter is used as a primary ingredient. Or as a significant component of a dish or a food. Butter is a dairy product that consists of butter fat, milk proteins, and water. It is made by churning fresh or fermented cream. Or milk. Last time. We got through... A bunch of these. Not all of them. But a good couple. We're picking up where we left off. Let's, uh... Let's check out buttercream. Wait, no. Buttercream we already did, because I remember this fucking cake. This wretched fucking cake. I hate this cake. Straight up cannot stand the look of this cake. <laughs> With a real-ass ribbon. It... <laughs> Rip, rip to your wedding, but your cake looks awful. It doesn't look like food. <laughs> your cake looks like an uncomfortable couch. <laughs> now fucking butter coochin or zucker coochin, we did do. But this one I thought was funny. And this is the one where I was fucking defeated uh, and got Yamcha in a crater. So I got to do this one again. Butter coochin or zucker coochin is a simple German butter cake baked on a tray. Flakes of butter are distributed on the dough, which, after baking, form the characteristic... Everyone in chat, say it with me now! Holes. Oh! <laughs> the whole cake is sprinkled with sugar, or streusel. After further kneading, the butter cushion is baked. As a variation, the dough can be sprinkled with roasted almond flakes. Butter cuchin is a favorite element of Westphalian and North German coffee tables. I don't know enough about North Germany to dispute that. <laughs> so I hope that's right. There's, there's no citation, but it doesn't say citation needed. So maybe it's one of those things where it's, it's simply known. Everyone just knows that. Everyone just knows that in the world, except for me. It's also served at weddings and funerals, and as a result is sometimes called the Freud and Leidkuchen, Joy and Sorrow Cake. <laughs> Or Beardy Gunskuchen Funeral Cake. <laughs> I fucking forgot about that bit! <laughs> this is the cake we enjoy at the combination wedding and funeral. <laughs> Thank you for the tip. Give me that Gustave de Laval. Gustave de Laval. I got you. Thank you for the tip. <laughs> A regional vari variation uh, is to sprinkle the butter kuchen with a sugar-cinnamon mixture rather than sugar alone. This is very similar to the Moravian sugar cake, which is a sweet coffee cake that is often made in areas around Moravian church settlements, particularly in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. 
Uh, it is made of a sweet yeast dough enriched with mashed potatoes. Huh! Mashed potato cake. What do you know? Uh, the dough is left to rise in a flat pan, and just before baking, deep wells are formed in the surface of the dough with the fingertips. Uh, and a mixture of melted butter, brown sugar, and cinnamon is poured on top. During baking, this forms a rich, sugary crust that permeates deep into the interior of the cake. Uh, Moravian sugar cake is best served warm from the oven, but it keeps at room temperature for several days, and also freezes well. The Moravian settlers... Moravian Church, or Moravian Brethren, formerly the Unitas Fratum, Unity of the Brethren, is one of the oldest Protestant denominations in Christianity, dating back to the Bohemian Reformation of the 15th century and the Unity of the Brethren, uh, founded in the Kingdom of Bohemia 60 years before Luther's Reformation. Christianity is an Abrahamic monotheistic religion based on the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. It is the world's largest religion, with roughly 2.3 billion followers representing one-third of the global population. Its adherents, known as Christians, are estimated to make up a majority of the population in 157 countries and territories, and believe that Jesus the son of, is the Son of God, uh, whose coming as the Messiah was prophesied in the Hebrew Bible called the Old Testament in Christianity, and chronicled in the New Testament. In demographics, the term world's population is often used to refer to the total number of humans currently living, and was estimated to have exceeded 7.9 billion as of September 2022. It took over 2 million years of human prehistory and history for the human population to reach 1 billion, and only 207 years more to grow to 7 billion. Prehistory, also known as pre-literary history, is the period of human history between the use of the first stone tools by hominins 3.3 uh, million years ago and the beginning of recorded history with the invention of writing systems. The use of symbols, marks, and images appears very early among humans, but the earliest known writing systems appeared 5,000 years ago. It took thousands of years for writing systems to be widely adopted, with writing spreading to almost all cultures by the 19th century. The end of prehistory, therefore, came at very different times in different places, and the term is less often used in discussing societies where prehistory ended relatively recently. Human history, also called world history, is the narrative of humanity's past. Humans, or Homo sapiens, are the most abundant and widespread species of primate, characterized by bipedalism and large, complex brains. This has enabled the development of advanced tools, culture, and language. Humans are highly social and tend to live in complex social structures, composed of many cooperating and competing groups, form families and kinship networks to political states. Social interactions between humans have established a wide variety of values, social norms, butter, and rituals, which bolster human society. Curiosity and the human desire to understand and influence the environment and to explain and manipulate phenomena have motivated humanity's development of science, philosophy, mythology, religion, and other fields of study. You know so what you they say? that down, right? That's gonna be on the test. You know what they say? If you want to bake a Moravian sugar cake, first you gotta create the universe. It's that simple. Folks, it's, it's real simple. simple. The Moravian settlers who came to North Carolina in 1753 and founded Salem in 1766 bought this recipe with them from eastern Pennsylvania and their settlements there. Moravian sugar cake is very similar to the German Zuckerkuchen, i.e. sugar cake, uh, made in Berlin, and Butterkuchen, butter cake, in Lundberg. There's, there's no link. There's no link. There's no link here. You can't click on it. There's no link. You, you, have, you gotta click on the link, but there's no link. You can't click on it to know about it because there's no link. There. They need a link. Someone's gotta put the link in there, but there's no link, so you can't look at it. Inclusion of mashed potatoes in the dough may have derived from the practice of using potatoes in dough starters to boost the growth of natural yeasts. Is that why, like, potato breads and stuff like that exist? To, like, help with the yeast? I never actually that knew that. That would make sense, wouldn't it? I, I suppose so. I've I've never really thought about it. I'm just like, oh, huh? Yeah, they put they put potato in bread. That, that's that shit good. <laughs> uh, often made for Holy Week and Easter, but not for funerals or weddings, I guess. Its popularity soon led to its appearance at other holidays and festivations, especially Christmas. Over the centuries, the recipe for Moravian sugar cake has changed title or changed little. And its renown has spread far beyond Winston Salem. Yo, they got Winston there? Oh shit! He's finally retired from Overwatch, and now he's just doing bakery. Good for him. Not really good for him. This is an improvement on every possible front. <laughs> he did his super gorilla jump away from Activision Blizzard. Now he's like, did someone say 
butter stream. <laughs> Excuse me for Moravian sugar cake. That famous thing he was always saying. Uh, rest in peace to him. It's so sad what they did to him. Uh, spread far beyond Winston-Salem so that it has become a beloved North Carolina breakfast confection. Is there anyone here from North Carolina? Can you, can you, can you corroborate? Can you confirm? <laughs> Specifically the Piedmont region. Also, I'm noticing there's a citation for this. Uh, Garner B, 2014. You, lying? Alright, block this overhead. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Farewell to big breasted men. <laughs> it's so sad what happened to the boobies today. <laughs> this is a loss heard around the world for tits everywhere. Uh, where was I fucking reading before I write? Uh, Garner B, 2014. Foods that make you say, mmm, mmm. Winston Salem, North Carolina. John F. Blair. <laughs> that famous thing Winston's always saying. This is. This is a book. I mean, you can cite a book, I suppose. <laughs> this is a whole ass book called Foods That Make You Say Mmm, Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> Holly just gave us top surgery fucked up. Well, hey, congratulations or I'm sorry, uh, depending on how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it or hate it for 300 seconds. <laughs> uh, right, this is where this fucking citation was. Freshly baked sugar cake is available at stores and bakeries in Winston-Salem and across the NC uh, PMO region. See also, list of cakes, list of foods of the southern United States. Oh, that's probably a good one. That's probably a fucking good one. Uh, Moravian Church at Old Salem. Yeah, this one sounds alright. I'd try it. Yeah, I'd eat that. <laughs> This is just gonna fucking turn into last night when we were watching <laughs> Bake Off and every time the food came on screen, I was just like, yeah, I'd eat that. <laughs> every single one. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say something and you never did. You never called my fucking bluff. <laughs> yeah, because I was also looking at them and thinking, yeah, I'd eat that. I know. <laughs> they all look really yummy. <laughs> they did. <laughs> They're making what were we gonna say? Oh, that looks like shit. I hate baklava. No, I'm gonna eat all the fucking baklava. Dude, they're making fucking baklava? That sucks. We're gonna attack the British with hammers now. I mean, I mean, that's unrelated to the baklava. I mean, yeah, I said that and was like, hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a joke. Thank you, Solus Kosh, for the 26 month reset. Much appreciated. Butter coochie. But yeah, it's. It's interesting that they just got potato in them, and like I never really considered why like baked goods would have potato in them. Like like they got like you know starches and sugar. Like the yeast would eat that shit up. Mm -hmm. Could you refresh real quick? Someone is claiming that Buderkuchen and Zuckerkuchen links have been added. Let's fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> glad I make a Wikipedia joke about, like, you know, actual use of the website and not just, like, vandalization and people actually do it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I was, like, genuinely so worried before stream. Like, I literally went back to List of Butter Dishes and checked out, like, the, the edit history and stuff when it's like, oh, no, I really hope no one vandalized this or anything while I was away. Uh... <laughs> No one did. There were no changes, except for, like, maybe some citations. <laughs> ah, I had to take a drink. We continue. With this one, I definitely clicked ahead of time, because it does say, Buttermilk pie. Type of desperation pie. <laughs> desperation pie. That's what I call it when I stress bake. <laughs> Desperation pie. 
Exploration Pie to me in my head when I first saw that. We could like click on the article for it and read more and we probably will because it's an interesting topic. But uh, I first saw that without like, you know, spending an ounce of thought thinking about what it might be or why. I was just like, oh yeah, that's the Danger Mario of pies, right? That's when your pie's at low health, but it does more damage. And there's like, there's like tense music playing. <laughs> Buttermilk pie is a pie in American cuisine. Pie in American cuisine has its own entire sub-article. I guess that makes sense. There's a whole lot of fucking pies in America. Makes sense. Makes sense. Associated with the cuisine of the southern United States, it is one of the desperation pies made using simple staple ingredients. Similar to and sometimes confused with chess pie. Is chess pie on here? No, it's not. So we'll click on that too. Uh, but it does not include cornmeal. Hi, <laughs> Duke. You made it just in time for butter. Hello, it's butter! The basic filling consists of a mixture of sugar, butter, eggs, buttermilk, and wheat flour. Uh, variations on the recipe include vanilla, lemon zest, nutmeg, and coconut. Buttermilk pies are made with a pie crust. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny to me! There are, there, there are some things you would call a pie that aren't, but just being so matter-of-fact, like, my pie is made using pie crust. It's just like, <laughs> it's, well, you see, that's often the case. <laughs> Your pie is made with pie crust. My pie is made from splinters. We are not the same. I am going to jail. <laughs> Understand the question? <laughs> <Help>. <laughs> uh, the filling is poured into the crust and baked until the mixture sets. The pie is best eaten at room temperature after being allowed to cool, but maybe eaten either warm from the oven or after being chilled. You know, if you want. If you want. It's up to you, I guess. It's, it's your choice. Fucking, I can't stop you. I'm a Wikipedia <laughs> article. It, I mean, it, it's funny that it's like, yeah, you know. If, Thank you, Inverted Error, for the 16 months. Much appreciated. It, it is funny that it's like, oh yeah, you know, uh, if you if you don't let it cool, then it's going to be runny and like drippy everywhere. So it's best if you let it cool for a bit, but I mean, you can still eat it if you want. <laughs> Just the fact that it's like, I mean, you can eat it fucking however. I, I can't stop you. Do what you want. It's, it's your funeral. It's your, it's your dessert. <laughs> uh, what the fuck is chess pie? A dessert with a filling composed mainly of flour, butter, sugar, eggs, and milk characteristics of Southern United States cuisine. Thank you, Doc, for the raid. Hope you had fun with New Vegas. We're checking out Chess Pie, which I've never fucking heard of. And I guess it just sounds like it, it sounds like pie, no additives. It, it sounds like the most basic form of pie. I mean, it literally just sounds like buttermilk pie again, but like allegedly without. Uh, cornmeal. Or with cornmeal. Or so something about cornmeal. <laughs> but it doesn't... H hang on, hang on. Okay. It does mention cornmeal, but only in some variations. Some variations. As, as such, some variations of chess pie might just be buttermilk pie. <laughs> in, which, in which case, what is the meaningful distinction here? <laughs> We're learning so much, and yet also... <laughs> it, like, it... There's probably some, uh, nuance of it that's lost to me, but it kind of just sounds like, yeah, the distinction of whether or not it's chess pie or buttermilk pie is, uh, depending on what you're calling it. <laughs> like, you know, the difference between, like, a... I don't know, a, a, a sugar pie with pecans on it and a pecan pie. Basically nothing, but the distinction still matters to people and in that they conceptualize it in different ways, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Chess pie was brought from England originally, that explains. <laughs> yep, there we go. There we go. <laughs> and was found in New England as well as Virginia. It has some similarities to English lemon curd pie. <laughs> Likely derived from recipes for cheese... Cheeseless cheesecake? For... Cheeseless cheesecake? Like, like, vegan cheesecake, or just no cheese, because... Just as in, like, making something like a cheesecake, but without any cheese. Huh. I don't know if something like this would have that similar of a texture or taste. Huh. 
interesting, interesting, that appeared in cookbooks as early as the 17th century, such as Martha Washington's Book of Cookery. I genuinely wonder if, like, Martha Washington's Book of Cookery is, like, um, public domain. I wonder. I, I had this idea, I mean, I've had this idea for, like, several public domain books. I think it'd be fun to stream them like I did with, uh... Christmas Carol uh, last year. Was it last year? I think it was last year. But I, I like Yeah, the, I, it was. I remember because I did the art for it. <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> uh, but I like the idea of just doing, like, you know, uh, public domain, like, notable books about, like, cooking and things like that. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. also so fucking happy to see someone in chat making. Th I'm pretty sure it's from Akewood just being like, yeah, sizzle the cake. It muffed sizzle. There's a bit in fucking Akewood where it's like an old recipe book and they're talking about like like steak or some kind of meat. And they're like, sizzle the meat. It muffed sizzle because F's and S's had like similar sounds. Something like that. It uh, muffed sizzle. It muffed sizzle. <laughs> I, have, I haven't even fucking read Akewood, but I know about that bit. <laughs> I, I keep getting distracted from chess pie. Chess pie has ruined us. And the English, a true gentlewoman's delight, 1653. I'm a gentlewoman. I fancy myself that. I ought to read that, even if I know it's going to be some tomfoolery because it was from the 1600s in England. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, a recipe. Bring... Sorry. Sorry. Can we bring gentlewoman back? Like, please. We gotta. We're, we're doing it. <laughs> New gender just dropped. Yippee! I think we're just reinventing butchness in a different way. You know, you're right, <laughs> but I would argue there, there's a different flavor, you know? Well, yeah, just like there's a different flavor between chess pie and buttermilk pie. You're so right. <laughs> a recipe explicitly called chess pie appeared in the 1877 cookbook by Estelle Woods Wilcox, Buckeye Cookery. Today, chess pie is most commonly associated as a dessert of the American South. Common types of chess pie are buttermilk, chocolate, lemon... It's not zooming in. I, I, I told it to zoom in, and it didn't zoom in. I broke the page. Wikipedia is denying this bit. <laughs> Hang on. Now it's letting me zoom in. And nut. Citation needed. <laughs> Sorry, I'm 13 years old about this joke, but like, this shit look like this. You can't just be like, oh yeah, and one of the flavoring is nut. Citation needed. Come on, bro. <laughs> Elaborate. Specify. <laughs> Several derivations of the name chess pie have been proposed. The most likely is a derivation of cheese pie, as early cookbooks grouped cheesecakes together with pies made of curd or custard. Huh. Interesting. I didn't actually know that. Huh. But I guess that makes sense. They have kind of a... similar enough conceptually in terms of, like, uh... Sort of the, the, the texture of, like, the, 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 I guess, the fruit of the cake. That's not the right fucking word. The meat of the cake. Maybe also not the right word. The, the main stuff of it. <laughs> it's close enough, I the cake suppose. Bit. Right. The, the, the bit, what is the cake? <laughs> and, like, the filling of pies like that. Uh, and, you know, how, like, a cheesecake will have, like, a, like, a crust on the bottom, and then a pie will have, a, also a crust on the bottom. Uh, so that makes sense. Uh, other possible derivations include the town of Chester, England, chest pie from pie chest, a type of furniture used to store pies prior to home refrigeration. 
All those damn kids swiping pies off of my windowsill. <laughs> I gotta stop by the bank and put something in my safety deposit box. <laughs> 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 there sure was some specific ass furniture and kitchen implements invented before, you know, the influx of easy refrigeration. <laughs> there sure was. Or an egg corn of it's just pie. Due to a misinterpretation of the pronunciation, it's just pie, in Southern American English. That's cute. I like that idea. That is cute. That's a fun one. Why is it called egg corn? In linguistics, an egg corn is an alter... I know what it is. Uh, egg corn, the original coinage was egg corn, but quickly became one word. As used to refer to this kind of substitution, was coined by Professor of Linguistics Jeffrey Pullum. Oh, I don't want... <laughs> Not on the first date, sir. <laughs> In September 2003, <laughs> in response to an article by Mark Lieberman on the website Language Log, a group blog for linguists, uh, Lieberman discussed the case of a woman who substituted the phrase egg corn for the word acorn. Oh, it's like doggy dog world! I get it! Okay. I see, I see. <laughs> Thank you, Rex fans, for she pull up on me, Jeffrey, till I egg corn. <laughs> Gustave de Laval. Is this anything? <laughs> it's everything. <laughs> that was pretty fucking good there, Rex. <laughs> Wait! The feeble position for the fetal position? I've never heard that in my life. <laughs> That's really fucking good. In one foul swoop? I've never heard of that one either! <laughs> I think some of these might just be like specific to whoever edited this page. <laughs> In one foul swoop is just making me think of with one wicked strike. <laughs> Popeye has accidentally killed Bluto. <laughs> oh, that's cute. That's cute. I like that. Uh, composition. I almost misread this as compost and I was like, no, you gotta eat it. It's got butter in there. The basic chess pie recipe calls for the preparation of a single crust and a filling composed of flour, butter, sugar, and eggs, and milk or condensed milk. Some variations call for the addition of cornmeal as a thickener. Many recipes call for an acid, such as, excuse me, vinegar, buttermilk, or lemon juice. Thank you, Solotomatonic, for the nine-month resub. I love butters. I didn't know there were so many. Oh, you don't know the fucking half of it when it comes to butter. Thank you for the resub. Buttermilk or lemon juice. In addition to standard chess pie, other flavor variations include lemon, coconut, and chocolate chess pie. This has a citation! <laughs> but common types doesn't! <laughs> some nut pies. Well, good for them, but they ought not to brag. Including some pecan, fall under the category of chess pies. Traditional pecan pie recipes do not include milk or condensed milk in the filling, and are typically regarded as a type of sugar pie similar to British treacle, uh, rather than a milk containing custard. See pecan pie variations. See also buttermilk pie, chess cake, gooey butter cake. I guess we'll, is is that also on the list? It is in fact on the list. We'll get to that one later. And list of pies, tarts, and flans. Treacle is a Pokemon? No, 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 no. You're thinking of, uh, Meltan. Common misconception. Buttermilk pie. Desperation pie is the one that I wanted to read. Desperation pies are pies in American cuisine made using staple ingredients like butter, sugar, eggs, and flour, and making use of other ingredients that cooks had on hand uh, to substitute for ingredients that were out of season or too expensive. These pies were more common before refrigeration and canned pie fillings, and during times of hardship, like the Great Depression, and rationing of World War II. Right, they're, they're, so they're called desperation pie because it's like, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're in desperate times. We gotta make do with what we got. Uh, what have we got? Butter? Flour? Things like that? It's, you know, like, like a lot of, like, 
poverty cooking or like cooking for lean times or things like that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, stuff like that, like the culinary history of stuff like that is interesting. I get mothballs uh, for the 11 month reset. Much appreciated. Desperation pie is when you just gotta have a slice. That's also true. <laughs> Uh, before refrigeration, homemakers could only cook with ingredients that were in season, so could not make fruit pies like apple pie when the fruits were not available or prices too high. Green tomato pie was commonly made as a mock apple pie, or mock mincemeat pie in the 19th century. Huh. Interesting. I didn't actually know that. I didn't know green tomato pie was a thing. I know- Yeah, I've never had a green tomato. Neither have I. I, I know that, like, fried green tomatoes are, like, a thing in the South, and, like, that's probably got an interesting history in regards to, like, you know, tomatoes that were, like, unripe or underripe, and it's like, well, we still have this as food, we can still maybe find some way to, like, make it palatable kind of thing. Hmm. That's neat. That's neat. Yeah. Aren't green tomatoes nightshade? All tomatoes are nightshade. All tomatoes are nightshade. In the same way that potatoes are also related to nightshade. That's... <laughs> It's not specifically the green ones that are related to nightshade, it's it's it's, it's the plant. <laughs> is I think yeah, eggplant is maybe also a nightshade, I don't remember. But I saw someone in chat say it, so I'm willing to believe them because I might also uh be misremembering that. So if we're if if you're lying, then I'm lying too. <laughs> Eggplant's also nightshade. Okay, awesome. Uh but yeah, there there's a lot of different plants that uh like have familial ties to deadly, deadly nightshade. Uh, but, you know, aren't deadly. <laughs> because they've been bred by, you know, plant breeders and botanists oh God, and is farmers. I gotta get out of here. No, no! Wrong kind of bread! Also, you started garbling for, like, all of that, but I got the gist of it. Uh-oh. <laughs> I, I don't know why that happened. I, I think your, like, mic is too close. Sometimes when you get, like, a little loud and breathy, it starts crackling. Let me just nudge that away a little bit. Just a little bit. Worth a try. Uh, shoe fly pie, chess pie, and sugar pie were common pies in the 19th century made with pantry staples. Oh, shoe fly. That makes more sense. I was reading it as shoe flea, and I was like, fuck's that? <laughs> no! It's shoe fly! <laughs> My good old shoe fly! <laughs> It's it's basically just like uh like a molasses pie type of thing and it's 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 also a similar sort of uh sort of like you know make shit with what we got on hand type of pie. Damn, that sounds good though. I've got molasses. I should make a shoefully pie. Is there a day shade? Yeah, it's what you get when the sun shines on a big tree. Got him. Hey. <laughs> Guy is so good. You gotta admit. <laughs> So that's buttermilk pie. Moving on to butterscotch. Type of confectionery. Oh god, I could go for a butterscotch right now! Wait, I might have butterscotch. Wait, I don't know how old those butterscotches are. Uh-oh! <laughs> Should I still eat them? Can butterscotch go bad? I don't know. I, I was about to say, yeah, baby, shampoo doesn't expire, baby, but I don't actually know if this shit can go bad. <laughs> <laughs> Everything can go bad die, eventually. Yeah. I mean, some things are in a much grander time scale than others, though. <laughs> like, you know, like leaving out a, 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 a peeled banana is going to go bad faster than, you know, uh, a pickle. Kind of thing. I don't really know where I'm going with this. Do you like this yellow? Are you enjoying my yellow screen? I guess orangey yellow. Something like that. Is... Are you enjoying? This is where they found the mosquito for Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> this is the amber version of the La Habrea tar pits or whatever the fuck. La <laughs> <laughs> Brea, darling! Close enough. <laughs> Scotch. For the singer slash beatboxer who appeared on America's Got Talent, see Butterscotch Performer. For the band, see Butterscotch Band. 
For similarly named South Park characters, see Butter is Stotch. I don't care about any of those. Tell me about Butter. We're here for Butterscotch! Butterscotch is a type of confectionery whose primary ingredients are brown sugar and butter. But other ingredients are part of some recipes, such as corn syrup, cream, vanilla, and salt. The earliest known recipes in mid-19th century Yorkshire used treacle, or molasses, in place of or addition to sugar. Butterscotch is similar- I almost misread that as coffee. Not- not right. <laughs> coffee? No, it's not coffee, it's toffee. It's different. Coffee! Toffee! What are we doing? <laughs> Reading about butter, honey! Hooray! I love butter! <laughs> Should I go eat some butter? No. At least some fucking bread to put it on. <laughs> I don't have any! <laughs> oh yeah! Thank you, Chill Cash Rain, for the 14 months! Well, butter my biscuits, it's a holly <laughs> Much appreciated. Get some coffee, some Cheetos, some chicken. Don't make me think about Cheetos coffee, don't do that to me. I don't remember if I've ever talked about Cheetos coffee on stream. I intend to keep it that way, though. Butterscotch is similar to toffee, but for butterscotch... <laughs> yeah? I read that wrong. <laughs> I read that wrong! <laughs> butterscotch is similar to toffee, but for butterscotch. That's... The article is over. <laughs> Put a pin in it, we're done. <laughs> butterscotch <laughs> is similar to toffee. But for butterscotch, the sugar is boiled to the soft crack stage, not hard crack as with toffee. Oh, I'm holding back so hard. Why, what's up? What's wrong? What? <laughs> Sorry, there's tears in my eyes. <laughs> I don't get it! <laughs> Oh. I was just thinking of candy making. <laughs> I have feelings for you. <laughs> it's, I don't know, something so fucking funny to me that the one crass joke that doesn't immediately come to me is the one that you're desperately trying not to make. <laughs> I love you. <sighs> I think I'm going to faint. <laughs> Holly has no concept of ass. I'll have you know my ass is quite fat, thank you. <laughs> Often credited- Hashtag badass. Hashtag <laughs> <soft crack. laughs> I gotta leave. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go. They're after me. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is happening on Butterscotch? I'm trying to read the Twitch the Wikipedia article about butterscotch, but I'm dummy thick, and the clap of my ass cheeks keeps alerting the Twitch stream. What do I do? Often credited with their invention, Parkinson's of Doncaster made butterscotch boiled sweets and sold them in tins, which became one of the town's best-known exports. They became famous in 1851, when Queen Victoria was presented with a tin when she visited the town. Butterscotch sauce, made of butterscotch and cream, is used as a topping for ice cream, particularly sundaes. The term butterscotch is also often used more specifically of the flavor of brown sugar and butter together, even if the actual confection butterscotch is not involved, such as in butterscotch pudding, a type of custard. Hang on, hang on. Uh... If hard lemonade is lemonade with alcohol, then hard crack is... Still, still a candy making stage. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't change things. Food historians have several theories regarding the name and origin of this confectionery, but none are conclusive. One explanation is the meaning to cut or score for the word scotch. Sister tones thickness. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. <laughs> Another idea is that it came from the adjective scotch, indicating association with Scotland. 
Also possible that the Scotch part of its name was derived from the word Scorch. In 1855, F.K. In the coffee, right there. Can you believe it? F.K., right there in the butterscotch. Robinson's Glossary of Yorkshire Words explained butterscotch as, quote, a treacle ball with an amalgamation of butter in it. That's a curious way of describing that. <laughs> Us and our amalgamation of butter here on stream today. <laughs> Ball! Oh. Ball! <laughs> now I'm just thinking about that fucking picture of Mario Golf Bowser pointing frantically at a golf ball and it just says, BALL! BALL! I think about that sometimes. <laughs> I, I need chat to understand that this beautiful woman, the love of my life, once said, spent like Remember the, the best part of an entire thing. evening just sending me that image repeatedly. Honey, I'll do it again. I know you will. <laughs> Stupid Mario, I'm fucking falling! <laughs> he says that in Mario Hoops. <laughs> That's why they never re released that game, because they let Bowser say fuck. <laughs> They let Luigi call you a little bitch, and that's why they never remade it. Luigi should be allowed. Luigi should get one. Oh yeah, you're a bitch. See, he deserves that. <laughs> yeah. Deserved it. He's famous we've, for always doing that. We've been playing Luigi's Mansion 3 again on my ch I say again because I've played it before. We haven't played it on the channel before. Mm -hmm. The point is, having played that recently and seen what Luigi's going through, he should be allowed to say bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he should be allowed to tell someone to get fucked, and then he just leaves. He should. Uh-uh, I'm going home. Fuck you. And then he just does it. Actually, fuck this. They, they should let him. <laughs> they should let him jump out the nearest window, do an action roll, and go home. <laughs> just to walk out. You can leave. It's so easy to leave. Now I'm just thinking about- this is completely unrelated, I don't know why it came to mind. Now I'm just thinking about that one fucking- I think it was a Tumblr post where someone was talking about, like, um... Like, the cast of Super Smash Brothers, like, all being in the same room together and talking with each other, and how, like... Wario is trying to convince everyone that he's the villain equivalent of Mario for marketing purposes, even though Mario is just like, No, I just play sports with that dude! <laughs> <laughs> and Samus is like, yeah, there's this evil version of me that's like a clone that was made out of a Metroid and it's hunting me down and it's completely merciless. And Wario's just like, That's the same thing with me and Mario! <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking obsessed with that! <laughs> That's the same thing with me and Mario! <laughs> oh my god. That's a good bit. <laughs> oh, I fucking lost our place in this article. I don't think it was an awkward zombie comic. Not the exact wording, at least. I wouldn't be surprised if there was an awkward zombie comic like that, though. It seems like something they would make as one of their comics. Yeah, same vibes, at least. I don't think it is... Specifically an awkward zombie comic, but the vibes are the same. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, right, we got we got to Weird Ball, that's where I left off. That's how we got on this tangent. Wario is also made a phase on? He sure fucking is. <laughs> Early mentions of butterscotch associate the confection with Don... Doncaster? They're calling me Doncaster. He's the... The one wizard in the Mafia, and that's why he's in, allowed in, because he can cast spells at them. I don't know where I'm going with this. Don Caster in like Yorkshire. A, that sounds like a Yakuza character we're eventually going to encounter. <laughs> this is the plot of Sopranos too. <laughs> <laughs> An 1848 issue of the Liverpool Mercury. Your liver should not have mercury pooling in it. You should see a doctor about that one gave a recipe for Doncaster butterscotch as one pound of butter, one pound of sugar, and a quarter of a pound of treacle, boiled together. Uh, 500 grams each of butter and sugar, and 125 grams treacle. You bet it's pronounced Dunster? I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Doncaster. Yeah, Doncaster. It's not... 
<laughs> it's not pronounced Drister. It's not pronounced Drister. <laughs> By 1851, uh, Donkster's Butterscotch was sold commercially by rival confectioners as Parkinson and Sons, still trading as Parkinson's, Henry Hall, Booths, all of Doncaster uh, via agents elsewhere in Yorkshire. Uh, Parkinson's started to use and advertise Doncaster Church as their trademark. It was advertised as Royal Doncaster Butterscotch or the Queen's Sweet Meat. Oh, don't call it that one. Oh, and... no, 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 no. <laughs> not, not fond of that one. I've seen sweet meat come up as like a term a couple of times, and every time it just sounds like viscerally unappetizing. <laughs> And said to be, quote, the best emollient for the chest in the winter season. Yeah, that sounds like something that <laughs> someone from the UK would say about a hawk of sugar in the 1800s. <laughs> 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 that's, that's why we had people in, like, the fucking states selling asbestos asthma cigarettes or whatever. Similar thing. Yeah. Parkinson's butterscotch was by appointment to the royal household and was presented to the Princess Elizabeth, then the Duchess of Edinburgh, in 1948, and to Anne Princess Royal in 2007. In the late 19th and 20th, early 20th century, the British sweet became popular in the U.S. Butterscotch is often used as a flavor for items such as dessert, sauce, pudding, and cookies! To that end, it can be bought in, quote, butterscotch chips. Made with hydrogenated solid fats so as to be similar to ba for baking use to chocolate chips. Uh, they are also individually wrapped translucent yellow hard candies. Butterscotch discs. That's an unappetizing way to describe that. With an artificial butterscotch flavor which is dissimilar to actual butterscotch. In addition, butterscotch flavored liqueur is in production. Where? <laughs> Makes it sound like a fucking upcoming game. Butterscotch liqueur is now in production. The book of butterscotch liqueur bobos is coming soon. <laughs> Tasty cake makes a cake known as a crimpet. <laughs> <laughs> Tasty cake makes a cake known as a crimpet. <laughs> <laughs> did, did a fucking tasty cake exec add this as advertising for their business? <laughs> they remove it because they're like, well, technically this is accurate. <laughs> That's so fucking weird. <laughs> Butterscotch sauce is made of brown sugar cooked to 240 degrees Fahrenheit, mixed with butter and cream. See also. Caramel. And Werther's Original. Werther's Original, from the original German, Werther's Ector, is a brand of caramel candy owned by the German company August Stork KG, based in Berlin, Germany. The candy is popular. Citation needed. In Europe and North America. <laughs> Big fan of just like, yeah, this thing's real popular. You got proof, jackass? <laughs> I think they mistook popular with sold in. <laughs> this candy. And I say that as a Werther's original liker. Yeah! The candy is popular. Everyone is buying it. Everyone is enjoying it. This is known. You know this. <laughs> Sources, fucker. Next up, buttery bread. Savory bread roll originating from Aberdeen, Scotland. A buttery, also known as a roey or Aberdeen roll. Or just roll. <laughs> is Mega Man's sister. Originating from Aberdeen, Scotland. Damn, that's where they produce roll? No kidding. Two Aberdeen butteries, also known as roeys. Serve with fruit preserve slash jam, one cut in half to show interior. The Aberdeen buttery is a specialty of the city of Aberdeen, Scotland. It was originally eaten at sea by fishermen from the city as an energy-dense food that was tastier than dry biscuits, 
but would not go stale easily. Ah, neat. I, I like this little, presume, like, press for, like, coffee or, or tea or something. It's got a cute shape to it. I like the spout on it. Yeah, I got one that's kind of like that. I'll show it to you when you visit. Hell yeah. I'm I'm always a big fan of, like, little presses like this. They, they're, they're cute. I like them. Yeah. Oh, Holly, you're going to enjoy going through all my teacups. Oh, probably. <laughs> Yo, this is the Archon Loaf from FF14. No, 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 no. This seems like it tastes good. <laughs> it's the main difference. <laughs> I, I guess I can elaborate on what that means for people that don't know shit about FF14. Um, I... Also, Plutes Boots, enjoy your new skull. So, uh, there's a place in the world of FF14 called Charlian. It's where a bunch of, like, scholars fucked off so they could go learn forever and never tell anyone what they're learning about. Uh, oh, grad school. Centrist grad school. Um, oh, no. So, uh, they're like, well, you know, we need a food that our scholars can eat uh, so that they won't, you know, go hungry uh, when they're having a bad case of hyperfocus. Uh, because, you know, they're just going to sit in the library for 30 hours and die of malnutrition kind of thing. Uh and so they're like, all right, we got to come up with food for them. And so someone was like, all right, I've gone to a lab. I've gone to the food science lab to construct the most ingenious, nutritionally complex and complete, uh, like, loaf of bread that anyone could ever possibly eat. And it is the perfect food, and you're going to eat it, and you're never going to eat anything else ever again. Uh, and you can spend as much time hitting the books as you want, aside from, like, you know, having to go to sleep or whatever. And it tastes fucking foul. Uh, because it's essentially just, like, a loaf of bread, uh, with garbage that has vitamins and minerals in it, uh, whacked in. And specifically, there's an entire, like, quest chain in Endwalker if you have, uh, alchemy, uh, or culinarian leveled up, uh, about how this dude has a hate boner for taste, uh, because a friend of his died, uh, eating food that was too unhealthy because it tasted good. <laughs> Help! <laughs> you, you, you know that bit from that one Trolls movie where the dude is like, because singing killed my grandma, okay? It's that, but an entire quest line about that, and instead of singing, it's... Taste. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anyways, buttery bread that allegedly tastes pretty good. <laughs> I can't allegedly. just I can't just say that to you completely unprepared. Smile. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Also, I guess instead of a grand a grandma, it was like my best friend. But close enough to grandma. <laughs> what is a best friend but a grandma but young? Makes you think. Really makes, makes you, think. you think. Origin. Legend has it that the buttery was made for the fishermen sailing from Aberdeen Harbor. The theory is they needed a bread that would not become stale during two weeks or more they were at sea. The high fat content meant the bread also provided an immediate energy source. Really getting killed by that Ugrami? <laughs> Fucking good one, dog. If I hadn't already given you VIP, I would have for that one. I can't give you <laughs> double gemstone. <laughs> Not yet. Butteries are typically made from flour, butter, lard, salt, sugar, and yeast. However, concerns have been raised about major commercial producers swapping the traditional butter and lard mixture for palm oil. Uh oh. How, how can you rightly call it a buttery if there's no butter? That's a palm oil. certainly that... can't keep talking about it on our butter stream if there's no butter in it. That's a palm oily. That's palm olive. You've made dish soap again. Butteries are noted for their flaky texture and buttery taste, similar to that of a croissant, and slight saltiness. Hey, thank you for the resub. Yippee! Thank you for the 15 months, Grand Voice Roy of the Empire. Much appreciated. 
They're often toasted and served with jam or butter, or plain with tea. Though the high fat content makes them extremely hot when toasted. Damn, those things get fucking sizzling, huh? Uh, as the alternative name of Aberdeen Roll suggests, butteries are a specialty of Aberdeen, but they're common throughout the northeast of Scotland and are available worldwide. Articles in the Aberdeen Journal from early in the 19th century bemoan the increased use of lard in place of butter in traditional, quote, butter rolls. <laughs> in I'm glad people have always been like this. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> All these years and people truly are still the same. In 1917, when restrictions were placed on the sale of bread owing to World War I, butteries were exempt, <laughs> enabling Aberdeen bakers to continue to produce rowies. The exemption was rescinded a few months later! <laughs> but appeals- Actually, never mind. <laughs> but appeals were made on the grounds that butteries were an intrinsic, quote, part of the food of the working classes and industrial centers. Aberdeen Food Aberdeen City Food Control Committee continued to challenge the validity of the restriction two years later, in 1919. I wonder if that's a committee that still exists. And I wonder I what wonder. they do if so. I wonder if they're still out here and now they're, you know, stirring up a stink about palm oil in these. <laughs> oh, I hope so. I hope so Someone's too. Someone's gotta. I hope so. In 2006, a buttery was offered for sale on eBay during a fundraising for the Royal Aberdeen Children's Hospital. The successful bidder, Enterprise Engineering, paid £620 for it. That's cute. <laughs> just, just, just one, though. <laughs> Only one. One single thing of- one single snack of bread to help raise funds for a children's hospital. <laughs> That's very funny, but it's cool that they got money for it. Radio and TV present- I- my- something's wrong with my fucking brain. I read that and I was like, oh yeah, Radio TV Solutions, that's mine. I'm in that one. No. That's you! <laughs> radio and TV presenter Sir Terry Wogan once memorably described eating a buttery as like having, quote, a mouthful of seaweed. Welcome, Sir Terry Wogan, to RTVS. Uh. Welcome, Sir Terry Wogan, posthumously, to RTVS. It's like when you give someone, like, a posthumous award. <laughs> it's like when someone's knighted after they're dead, but more- but better because it's coming from me and not the queen. Exactly. Hang on. All of that, and I completely didn't notice, World Buttery Championship. <laughs> the first ever World Buttery Championships took place on Saturday, 16th of June, 2018, at the Aberdeen campus of Northeast of Scotland College. The competition was organized by Martin Gillespie on behalf of Slow Food Aberdeen City and Shire to celebrate the traditional buttery being, quote, boarded onto the Slow Food Arc of Taste? An international catalog of endangered heritage foods, which is maintained by the global slow food movement. An organization that promotes local food and traditional cooking. That sounds like an interesting idea at the very least. Yeah. Uh, I'm not reading into it more so that I can't, you know, have have my illusions of something nice in the world being shattered, but... <laughs> God, yeah. Because that, that does kind of sound like the thing that people would either be uh, very presumptuous about uh, or very xenophobic about. <laughs> uh, the arc is designed to preserve at-risk foods that are sustainably produced, unique in taste, and part of a distinct eco-region. Contrary to the most literal definition of plant and animal conservation, the Ark of Taste aims to maintain edibles in its purview by, acti by actively encouraging their cultivation for consumption. By doing so, uh, slow food hopes to promote the growing and eating of foods that are sustainable and produce biodiversity in the human food chain. That doesn't sound bad in theory. I hope it's not bad. <laughs> please, please, please let us have one good thing. Uh... Ten finalists took part in a live bake-off, and the results were judged in a blind taste test with Mark Barnett of Golden Crispy. <laughs> new, <laughs> uh, you know, new, new Pits Lego being crowned the winner. Golden Crispy. I guess that's like a specific Scottish thing that we've never heard of, and it's just got a funny sounding name. <laughs> Such an 
awkward photo. None of them are looking at the camera. None of them. I. This is probably just a case of like it being taken at a weird time, but none of them look happy to be here. They look confused. They got airdropped in here, and they're like, "Wait, what are we doing?" Photo op. They look like they're posing into a different camera that just finished taking the photo. It. You 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 know those photo shoots where it's like, oh yeah, uh, models before and after someone told them they were beautiful. <laughs> this looks like the logical opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> Models before and after we told them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, making Aberdeen butteries. <laughs> I love the slop full in the corner. <laughs> this is cow tools to me. <laughs> it's a little bit cow tools. Buttery tools. It's just a heap of dough in a slop bowl. <laughs> The countertop is very nice, and I do like the look of this rolling pin, um, but this is such a vague nothing. <laughs> Making butteries. <laughs> this just makes me think of the picture I posted of my fucking beans the other day when I was like, my meal. It's a little, it's a little bit my meal. <laughs> <sighs> on that note, I am due to get up and have a stretch, so I'm gonna flip on over. I'm already on the BRB screen. I'm gonna turn off this, uh, and then I am going to get up, have a stretch, refill my tea, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm gonna hit the button to run the ads, so this is a perfect opportunity for you to get up and have yourself a stretch or a drink, anything like that. It was beans? Yeah. What did What did you think it was? <laughs> It was black beans! I like sauteed onions and garlic! <laughs> and then put a can of black beans with the liquid in! <laughs> Hang on, I'll, I'll pull this up on stream before I run the fucking ads just so you can all see my meal. <laughs> my meal. Her meal. <laughs> okay. My meal. Her meal. <laughs> Did I make this on a Thursday? Oh my fucking god, I did! I'm thinking about those beans on a Thursday, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was onions again? No! <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever fucking told this story. I made a video to send to- just, just to send to my sister, I think, like years and years ago, of me just like running to my computer and then scrolling down, like, Google images, and just, like, nothing but, like, pictures of beans, and I just go, Thursday night, motherfuckers! <laughs> I just remembered that. Sounds that. right. I just remembered that. <laughs> so, <laughs> years-long proof that I've just always been like this, I suppose. <laughs> and thank God for that. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna actually go on break now. I'll be back. Uh, in just a few. You get up and have yourself a stretch as well. I'll see you in about three or so minutes. See in three. Where can you find that video? Nowhere. I didn't post it online. I sent it to my fucking sister. <laughs> That's not for you. That's mine. Listen <laughs> you... to the sentences that are being said to you. <laughs> I'll be right back.
Hello. Hello. I'm back. I am also back. Thank you, Metasaur, for the raid. Hope you had yourself a good stream today. We are getting back to butter dishes. I turned the music down because I felt like it was kind of loud on my end, but now I'm wondering if it's too loud. This this one song specifically is just kind of loud. There's always one. There's always at least one. Eh, that's, that's what happens when you uh, <laughs> just pull up a bunch of random videos to use as a playlist instead of having a bunch of things on my computer meticulously audio balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, it is what it is. Let's it is uh, what it is. get back to butter. Next up, Chicken Kiev. It's chicken dish. Chicken Kiev. Uh, and a bunch of things in Ukrainian and Russian that I have no idea how to pronounce. Uh, sometimes known as Chicken Kiev is a dish made of chicken fillet. Uh, pounded and rolled around cold butter, then coated with egg and breadcrumbs, and either fried or baked. Stuffed chicken breast is generally known in Ukrainian and Russian cuisine as uh, kotlet de volai. Since fillets are often referred to as suprême in professional cookery, the dish is also called a suprême de volai à la Kiev. Though it has disputed origins, the dish is particularly popular in the post-Soviet states, as well as in several other countries of the former Eastern Bloc and in the English-speaking world. This is a little bit of a mess meal. It's a little bit slop meal. A not, little... not, not complete slop meal, but bordering. A little it's bit meal of... which contains slop. A little bit of a chicken roll-up blood and gore moments. <laughs> mess all over the plate. You cut this shit open, it's bleeding out. Oh god. Help it, help not it. a little bit of flesh. Need a bandage to help stow the stem of blood coming out of here. Or butter, I guess. A little bit bag of flesh, just like a little. Slop meal, slop meal, slop meal. Apparently it slop is meal. just now my 11 month anniversary. Yeah. In the middle of the stream. Yeah, <laughs> it sure is. Thank you for the 11 month resub, much appreciated. Uh, also known as these. Its course is the main one. Uh, place of origin was the Russian Empire. Associated national cuisine, Ukrainian and Russian. Serving temperature hot. <laughs> Uh, main ingredients, chicken, chicken, oh, I thought it said chicken breast and then in brackets garlic for chicken breast, and I was like, what is a garlic chicken? <laughs> it's, it's chicken breast and then garlic butter. Uh, herbs, eggs, and breadcrumbs. Uh, thank you, Stardeck, for the seven month reset. Much appreciated. Happy almost birthday. Not quite yet. It's my birthday tomorrow. But I hope you enjoy a cake. A cake. The history of this dish is not well documented, and various sources make claims about its origin. Since the 18th century, Russian chefs have adopted many techniques of French haute cuisine, and combined them with the local culinary tradition. The adoption was furthered by the French chefs, such as Marie-Antoine Carême and Urbain Dubois. I thought it said Urban, Urban Dubis at first, and I was like, what the fuck is They're that? all Urban Dubis in all his meals. <laughs> <laughs> that famous Dubis that we all know from these days. Making chicken for you. I I also almost misread this. It says who were hired by Russian gentry, but I almost misread it as who were hired by Russian guys. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. They were in fact hired by Russian guys. Technically. <laughs> in particular, the use of quality meat cuts, such as various cutlets, steaks, escalopes, and suprems, became widespread in the 19th century. A number of original dishes involving such components were developed in Russia at that time. Cotelet de la de volaille. Here's a picture of it. Common Russian minced chicken cutlets. With, uh, some slop beans on the side. The French term de volaille means literally of poultry, and denotes almost exclusively chicken dishes in French cookbooks. Uh, the name Cote. Oh, sorry, I've, I've been. No, I've been reading it right, Cotelet. I thought it said coletel for a second, and I was like, what the fuck is that? Uh, cutlet de volaille means thus simply chicken cutlet. <laughs> but we have to say it in French so that you think it's fancier. A little bit omelette du fromage kind of deal happening. Little bit! <laughs> Despite the original French name, the Russian recipe is unknown in French cuisine, where the term cutlet de volaille refers to chicken breasts in general. 
and is used nearly synonymously with chicken filet or suprême. The French term also denotes a minced chicken cutlet-shaped patty. The general Russian term for chicken cutlets, uh, kurinaya kotleta, refers predominantly to such minced cutlets, whereas kotleta de volaille uh, is applied exclusively to the stuffed chicken breast dish. The latter name appears in the pre- and post-revolutionary Russian literature, in cookbooks as well as in fiction, since the beginning of the 20th century and is usually mentioned as a common restaurant dish, with uh, no less than six different citations on that one. <laughs> you want evidence? We got evidence! You want proof? Proof. The recipe in the classic Russian cookery textbook, The Practical Fundamentals of the Cookery Art, by Pelageya Alexandrova Ignatieva, which had 11 editions between 1899 and 1916. My god, lots of revisions. Includes a complex stuffing similar to quenelle. The hell's that? Uh, oh, it's, it's French, so quenelle. A uh, mixture of creamed fish or meat, sometimes combined with breadcrumbs and light egg binding, formed into an egg-like shape and then cooked. Again, a little bit of a slop meal. Just a little. Just a, just a, just a little bit. <laughs> I don't know why this is so fucking funny to me, but pictures like this always are a laugh riot to me. <laughs> I mean, Quinelles. <laughs> I think it's the all caps with a period that has something to do with it that just makes it uproariously funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just picturing someone sternly shouting this at the top of their lungs, like their voice is going a little hoarse. <laughs> it's it's like a fucking bark in a video game when you're throwing a frag grenade. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <sighs> Oh, also, it literally just said here in brackets what a what a canal was. A mixture of minced meat, in this case, the rest of the meat of the chicken, and cream. Uh, but with butter added. It also points out that, quote, the cutlets de volaille are made from whole chicken fillets, like the game cutlets a la maréchale. The recipe is preceded by a similar one for, quote, hazel grouse cutlets a la maréchale, with a quenelle and truffle stuffing. Another Russian cookbook published at the same time gives basically identical recipes for cutlet de volaille, or cutlet de volaille, and cutlet à la maréchale, and notes that the only difference between them is that the former are made of chicken while the latter are made of game, such as hazel grouse, black hawk, etc. The term à la maréchale, or martial style, list of marshals of France, by the way, <laughs> denotes... Okay. Pardon? In case you need them. Just just in case you need to know about all those marshals out there. Denotes in French cookery tender pieces of meat, such as cutlets, escalopes, sweetbreads, or chicken breasts, which are treated à l'anglaise, or English style, i.e. coated with egg and breadcrumbs and sautéed. Sweetbread is a culinary name for the thymus, or the throat, gullet, or neck sweetbread, or pancreas, also called the stomach, belly, or gut sweetbread. Typically from calf or lamb, if you were wondering what a sweet bread was. It is, uh, it is awful. Awful is an O-F-F-A-L, not A-W-F-U-L. I've never tried it, so I wouldn't know. Uh, Mileage may vary. Maybe you also think it's awful. I've, I've had, I've had tripe though before. I've had intestine. I had that in, uh, a bowl of pho. It was pretty good. It didn't have much taste. It was mostly texture, but it was, a uh, interesting texture. Yeah. Why did they call it that? It's not sweet, nor is it a bread. The word sweet bread is first attested to the 16th century, but the etymology of the name is unclear. Sweet is perhaps used since the thymus is sweet and rich tasting, as opposed to savory tasting muscle flesh. Bread may come from Middle English bread, meaning roast meat. There you go. <laughs> no one fucking knows, but maybe this is why. <laughs> uh, right, okay. Numerous recipes of such dishes, some of them with stuffings, are described in both Western and Russian cookbooks in the 19th century. Among the stuffed version, one f one finds <laughs> one finds a recipe for a quote foul fillet à la maréchale, stuffed with truffles and herbs in quote or er, not quote in the art of French cuisine of the 19th century, uh, by Marie Antoine Carême. 
and a similar filet de poulet à la maréchale with herbs and forcemeat in La Cuisine Classique by Urbain Dubois uh, in 1868. Forcemeat, derived from the French farcir to stuff, is a uniform mixture of lean meat with fat made by grinding or sieving the ingredients. Uh, the result may either be smooth or coarse. Force meats are used in the production of numerous items found in charcuterie, including quenelles, sausage, pâtés, terrines, roulades, and gal ga ga galantines. Sorry. Uh, force meats are usually produced from raw meat, except in the case of a gratte. Uh, meats commonly used include pork, fish, such as pike, trout, or salmon, uh, seafood, game meats, such as venison, venison, boar, or rabbit, poultry, game birds, veal, and pork livers. Pork fat back is preferred as a fat, as it has a somewhat neutral flavor. Squab force meat, uh, with seeps, anise, and combo of juice, which uh, I, 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 I think this is a picture that inspired someone to make that one that was like the, 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 the horn gis of a dude fish is called a grobble or whatever the fuck that one picture says, <laughs> because it does just kind of sound like words someone made up. <laughs> Also, the, the, like, weird coat of bubbles on this is, like, viscerally unappetizing to me. Yeah, that's too many bubbles. Not, not keen on that one, Coach. You got a little bit of that bad stuff on there. You gotta clean that up. <laughs> I think you might have run this through the dishwasher first. <laughs> got a little bit of that scum on there. You gotta, you gotta wash up after yourself. This is a five-star restaurant for fuckers. <laughs> uh, hang on. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. I tabbed out of something for a second. There we go. Okay. Uh, there we go. Elena Molo Molokovets, A Gift to Young Housewives, which looks like a fucking... That's a brick. A Gift to Young Housewives, because it's like... the. Yeah, it's the 20th century. You might still need to kill this man. <laughs> a, a, gift, a gift for young housewives. And you turn it over and on the other side it just says, Chuck this at him. <laughs> Throw this. <laughs> the most successful Russian cookbook of the 19th century has included since its first edition in 1861 an elaborate recipe for, quote, hazel grouse a la maréchale stuffed with Madeira sauce, portobello mushrooms, and truffles. Bound in her husband's skin? What is this? The, the divorce Omicron or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you really liked that one, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I'm glad. <laughs> I was desperately trying to come up with something in my head that sounded better than the divorce Omicron, but nothing was firing. <laughs> <laughs> because nothing is better. That's the peak. <laughs> A uh, Pajarski cutlet. The main difference between the old-time cutlet de volaille and the modern chicken Kiev is that the elaborate stuffings of the former are replaced by butter. The use of butter yes, for yes. <laughs> just butter. <laughs> the use of butter for chicken cutlets has been known in Russian cuisine at least since the invention of the Pajarski cutlet in the first half of the 19th century. The Pajarski cutlets are breaded ground chicken patties for which butter is added to minced meat. The, the result is an especially juicy and tender consistency. The dish was a widely appraised invention of 19th century Russian cuisine, uh, which was also adopted by French haute cuisine and subsequently by the international cuisine. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. You've got people when they're making, like, turkeys and stuff, they will, like, uh, inject them with butter to help them stay, like, moist and stuff. So, like, yeah, it, it turns out uh, mixing, you know, a bit of, like, liquid to semi-solid fat with uh, the hunk of the bird that typically can kind of end up being kind of dry sometimes. Makes sense. It just works. Butter. It just works. Butter. Give him the juice. Butter. Start slopping that shit. Uh, all official slogans. Uh, while the roots of chicken Kiev can thus be traced back to French haute cuisine and Russian cookery of the 19th century, the origin of the particular recipe known today as chicken Kiev remains disputed. And here's a Pajarski cutlet. Good looking potatoes. Oh, that's some potatoes. How long has this track been going again? Not too, too long. You have to understand that I put in like 20 remixes of the same song, though, because it's the... It's the, the butter, butter song. Playlist. 
It's the butter song from Kirby. <laughs> That's the joke of the playlist, is that it's butter music! <laughs> Individual attributions. The article for Chicken Kiev, it's so goddamn long. It's fascinating. There's so much to be said about Chicken Kiev. There is so much fucking nuance in history to Chicken Kiev, and I had no idea. Uh, the Russian- Why do we do this? We're learning. You know, I suppose we are. The Russian Tea Room Cookbook notes that Chicken Kiev was, quote, most likely a creation of the great French chef Carême at the court of Alexander I. Marie-Antoine Carême spent just several months of the year, 1818, in St. Petersburg, but made a profound impact on Russian cuisine in the short time. The reforms carried out by his followers introduced in a particular, in particular, various meat cuts into Russian cookery. The recipe of, rutten, of Russian, not rutten, uh, cutlette de volaille, is not present in Carême's major work mentioned above, but his Fowl Filet à la Maréchale could have served as the starting point for the further development of such dishes. I almost misread that as diseases. I keep reading shit wrong today. <laughs> I misheard that as Fowl is an F-O-U-L and was like, damn, they're going off on him. <laughs> <laughs> they fucking hate his meals. They can't stand them. Get that bitch out of Russia. Some Russian sources attribute the creation of this dish, or of its precursor, to Nicolas Appert, French confectioner and chef, best known as the inventor of airtight food preservation. In contrast, common biographic sources for Appert do not mention this dish, and the origin of these claims is unclear. I have to bump up the volume of this song. Give me just a sec. This one's quiet. This one's also only a minute 30 long, so I sure hope the next one isn't overly loud. Fingers fucking crossed. There's only one way to find it out. Uh, Novo Mikhailovsky Cutlet. Russian food historian, uh, William Pokliobkin, I'm so sorry, Will, for pronouncing your name wrong, claimed that Chicken Kiev was invented in 1912 uh, as Novo Mikhailovskaya Kotleta in a St. Petersburg Merchants Club located near Mikhailovsky Palace and is renamed Kotleta Pokievsky in 1947 by a Soviet restaurant. However, these claims collide with primary sources. This is just reminding me of, like, how there's so many hyper-specific variants of a food in, like, uh, I feel like it's almost always the tri-state area of, uh, the United States, and how there's, like, four different people claiming, no, we invented it, no, my grandpa invented it, no, these guys invented it, no, I know who invented it, and, like... Oh, Holly, <laughs> you only think it's four. <laughs> I know, it's more than that. Uh... Four one block. Hey, did Twitch chat just die? Uh-oh. No, it seems like it's still working for me, okay. Uh, it, like, I didn't see any messages for a bit, and then it just told me, welcome to the chat room again. Uh, which it does to me sometimes, but also the no messages made me like, oh shit, did something happen? <laughs> Sorry, I got scared for a second. <laughs> you ever see so few messages that you get scared? <laughs> Rarely, <laughs> but sometimes it is known to happen. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh... The cookbook by Alexandrova Ignatieva, including editions before and after 1912, describes indeed Novo Mikhailovsky cutlets and mentions they were invented in the club near the Mikhailovsky Palace. However, in the provided recipe, these cutlets are made from minced meat similarly to the Pajarsky cutlet, with the only difference being the meat pounded by a tenderizer until it gets minced. This allows one to remove tendons from the meat and results in a more tender consistency of the ground meat than after the use of a grinder. The author also remarks that not only breasts but also other parts of chicken can be prepared this way, and added to the mixture of meat and butter. The second claim of uh, Pokilyobkin's version is invalidated, as references of Chicken Kiev appeared in published sources much earlier, since the 1910s. There is so much contention about where the fuck chicken and butter came from. Sorry, what? I heard the word breast and then I stopped listening. I... <laughs> You were gonna say something like that! <laughs> <laughs> I love to be predictable and lesbian! <laughs> I know this and I love you dearly for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know if any 
would have fucking noticed. They're probably gonna say, yeah, we did, now that I'm pointing it out. But when I got to the word breast when I was reading that and I lingered on it for a second, I was like, do I make a joke? Do I make a crass joke? Then I just kept going instead because I couldn't think the of anything. The answer's no because I already got you. <laughs> we make a good team. Yeah! <sighs> Modern Chicken Kiev. Oral tradition in Kiev attributes the invention of the Kotlet de Volai Kiev style, Kotleta de Volai Pokievsky, uh, to the restaurant of the Continental Hotel in Kiev in the beginning of the 20th century. A luxury hotel built in 1897 in the center of Kiev, it was run until the Nazi German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. The building was then mined by the retreating Red Army and exploded when the, Gen the German army occupied Kiev uh, in September 1941. After the war, the building was rebuilt and has since been used by the Kiev Conservatory. According to the memoirs of contemporaries, Chicken Kiev was the signature dish of the hotel's restaurant. I'm only just realizing now when they say it was mined that they, like, put, like, landmines, like, explosive mines, like, they rigged it with explosives so that, like, the, the, the Nazis would go in there and fucking blow themselves up. I need you to know I read that and was like, what do you mean? Did it have, like... A alloys and metals they wanted to get out and salvage? But did that cause the foundation to collapse on the on the Nazis? And I'm realizing, no. Explosives. <laughs> right. The other mines. <laughs> I've been playing too much fucking Deep Rock, dude. <laughs> Something's wrong with me. <laughs> yeah, it's called being fucking awesome. You know, maybe you're on to something. <laughs> According to the memoirs of contemporaries, Chicken Kiev was the signature dish of the hotel's restaurant. An early reference of Kiev cutlets from chicken or veal was found in the Cookery Digest, 1915, a collection of recipes which were published in the Moscow Journal for Housewives in 1913-14. Uh, these were minced meat cutlets similar to the Pozharsky cutlets, but shaped like a croquette, with a bar of solid cold butter placed in the middle. <laughs> That's one way to do it, I suppose. <laughs> Holly will see a dwarf and froth at the mouth. You don't even fucking know. You have no idea. <laughs> if if I'm playing some sort of fantasy thing and I don't feel like playing a human or playing some kind of like cool construct thing, it's gotta be dwarf. <laughs> it's gotta be. <laughs> I, I need you all to know, uh, they announced that the like official paid release of Dwarf Fortress with, like, the, uh, the, the, the new tile set coming out. Uh, they announced it for, like, December, and I need you to know, something is going to fucking happen to me in December. I can't Some wait. Something is going to fucking happen to me in that month, and that's all I can rightly say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Drillbot, for the 9 month reset. Sponsored by dwarves. Butter should be sponsored by dwarves. <laughs> How many dwarves am I going to accidentally induce self-sacrificial insanity on? Knowing what I know about Dwarf Fortress, I think a better question is how many is that not going to happen to? <laughs> how many will survive? Dwarf Fortress stream? Smile. <laughs> Smiling so sweetly at the camera. Uh, like modern chicken Kiev, the croquettes were covered with egg and breadcrumbs and fried. Here is, uh, the recipe. I can't read it because it's not in English or French, but it, it is so documented. Hmm. I'm looking at it. I'm reading it. Yep. The two sentences I Google translated did not prepare me to read Russian. Let's go. <laughs> and here's the Continental Hotel in Kiev. It's a nice hotel. Yeah. Later, uh, quote, chicken cutlets Kiev style were listed in apportionments for dinners, separate dishes, and other products of a public of, of public catering, 1928, which served as a standard reference for Soviet catering establishments. Uh, the book also included other items for chicken cutlets, such as cutlet de volaille and cutlet à la maréchale. The book demanded... I almost thought it said the book dead named. <laughs> Don't do that! The book demanded renaming of many traditional restaurant dishes to replace the mostly French-style bourgeois names with simple proletarian forms. In particular, the cutlet Kiev style uh, had to be renamed into chicken cutlet stuffed with butter. 
This program was not realized immediately, at least not completely, and its successor, the Directory of Apportionments for Catering in 1940, published by the Soviet Ministry of Food Industry, still included the traditional names. How does one murder a boat? Oh, you don't even fucking know. <laughs> you, How you don't you murder a boat? They don't know. They don't even know. <laughs> Thank you, FedArx, too, for the five-month resub. Much appreciated. Uh, for, for the folks that actually don't know, though, Boat Murdered is the name of a very famous, uh, uh, basically Let's Play of Dwarf Fortress, where the fort was, like, passed on to different people. Like, the save game was given to them, and they got to, like, uh, control the fort of their own whims. Uh, and it's, it's called Boat Murdered because that was the, like, auto-generated name for the fort. Dwarf Fortress will auto-generate a lot of very fun names for you. Uh, and that's something about it I've always really liked. Um, uh, it involves elephants? <laughs> a, l <laughs> a lot of interesting happenings, and interesting and happenings are both capital I, capital H, and in quotation marks, in Dwarf Fortress seem to involve elephants. <laughs> You should all go read Boat Murdered at some point. Uh, I don't remember how well it holds up language-wise. You know, it was something posted on fucking something awful in the, what, early to mid-2000s kind of thing. So, like, mileage may vary and all that, but... To say uh, the least. I remember it being a fucking ride. Uh, where was I? I was reading about this, not about dwarves. Um... In post-World War II publications of this directory and in other Soviet cookery books, such as Cookery 1955, the, the Kiev-style name was retained, but the terms de volaille and à la maréchale were indeed dropped in favor of simple names such as chicken cutlet stuffed with milk sauce, chicken cutlet stuffed with liver, uh, and chicken cutlet stuffed with chicken quenelle and mushrooms. Doesn't hold up what the later ones do, like head shoots and syrup leaf. You know, I trust Doc's opinion. Go check out those ones. As a result of this- actually, I'm gonna fucking copy the names of those so I can look those up my own later and maybe read those tomorrow or something. <laughs> Hang the fuck on. <laughs> Alright. Awesome. Alright. Uh, as a result of this policy, the name De Valais and A La Maréchale disappeared from menus of Soviet restaurants. The, quote, old-style name, Cutlet De Valais Kiev style, uh, was occasionally mentioned in some post-World War II Soviet fiction books. In particular, in a short story, This Is Not Written in a Cookbook, 1947, uh, by Yevgeny Vorobyov, a Soviet soldier and former chef in a Moscow noble hotel, explains to his comrade-in-arms that cutlets de valai are made for two tastes. There are cutlets de valai Kiev style and cutlets de valai jardiniere. The name cutlet de volai is used to this day for chicken Kiev in Poland. The name is oftentimes Polonized as uh, de volai, uh, de Valai with an E at the end for plural. Uh, mentions of Chicken Kiev are also found in U.S. newspapers starting from 1937. The reports describe the Russian-style restaurant Yar in Chicago serving the dish. The restaurant existed until 1951 and was run by Vladimir Yashenko, a former colonel of the Imperial Russian Army. Uh, it was styled after the famous eponymous Moscow restaurant and was frequented by celebrities of that time. After World War II, United States newspapers mentioned chicken Kiev served in New York restaurants. Recipes for a, quote, chicken cutlet a la Kiev were published in the New York Times in 1946 and in the Gourmet magazine in 1948. Since the end of the 1940s or beginning of the 1950s, chicken Kiev became standard fare in Soviet high-class restaurants, in particular in the Intourist hotel chain serving foreign tourists. Tourist booklets warned the diners of the danger it presented to their clothing. <laughs> oh no, this is the chicken squirter. Oh, oh are we God. Allowed to call it that? I don't know, but I'm doing it anyway. Hooray! <laughs> Warning, this dish, this dish sloppy. <laughs> this dish straight up sloppy with it. Free sloppy at the Russian hotel chain? It's not free, but... <laughs> The sloppy is free, the food is not. You gotta pay for the meal, but the sloppy is free. <laughs> <laughs> First row will get buttered. This stream is intended for mature audiences. <laughs> <laughs> At the 
the same time, the popularity of this dish grew in the U.S. According to Dara Goldstein, Chicken Kiev became, quote, a symbol of Russian haute cuisine. After the Russian Federation started an open war of aggression against Ukraine in 2022, supermarket chains the United Kingdom, Australia, and Canada changed their labeling from a Russian spelling to the Ukrainian form Chicken Kiev to show respect and support for Ukraine and Ukrainians? I always feel kind of weird about companies doing that. It's like, yeah, sure, that'll show them, I guess. It's like, damn, I will stop eating the Russian food, but I'll eat this one, it's the same thing. It's just we gave it a different- It's- it's like fucking freedom fries in America, but different. It's like... Uh, it's weird. It's weird. It- it accomplishes nothing. <laughs> it- it accomplishes nothing, but like, I don't know, Mr. Chicken Mogul sits in his, like, VIP lounge, Getting billions of dollars and going, hmm, really makes you think. Like, uh, <laughs> it's nothing. It's nothing. Variants. Here's something. Chicken Kiev is made from a boned and skin breast, which is cut lengthwise, pounded, and stuffed with butter. Western recipes usually call for garlic butter, while in Russian ones, regular butter is used. Herbs parsley and dill can be added to the butter. Liberty cabbage instead of sauerkraut? It's on par with some shit like that, huh? <laughs> In some American recipes, butter is replaced by blue cheese. That's... I feel like that's just something fundamentally different at that point. Like, blue cheese has a different taste and texture to butter. Like, similar enough that, yeah, I, I can see it's still working, but it's it's different. It's different. In the classical preparation of French cotelette de valaille, the humorous bone of the, of the wing is left attached. I don't see what's so funny about it. This also holds for the Russian versions, and in particular for Chicken Kiev. For a serving, the bone is usually covered with a frilled paper napkin. Oh my god! Like when you have like a whole roasted like chicken or turkey or something? Oh my god, <laughs> it's the cartoon drumstick! Literally! <laughs> but for Chicken Kiev! <laughs> However, industrially produced pure fillets are often used nowadays, and the cutlets are served without the bone. This is the usual way of serving chicken Kiev in the U.S. A spherically shaped version was developed by English chef Desi or Jesse Dunford Wood. Okay, good for him, I guess. Hashtag ball. Oh, boneless version. Boneless moment. I, you know, I always used to think those little, like, paper napkin cover things that they put on, like, roasts and cartoons and stuff were, like, a part of the chicken or a part of the turkey. And whenever I saw them in real life, I was always just like, well, where's where's the thing on it? The, the, the thing's not on it. Oh, they must have removed it. They must have removed it so it'd be easier to cook for people at home. I see. It must be, like, a fancy thing. I get it. I get it. It's, it's a napkin. It's, it's not a part of a bird. <laughs> Convenience food. In the middle of the 20th century, semi-processed ground meat cutlets were introduced in the USSR, colloquially known as Mikoyan cutlets, named after Soviet politician uh, Anastas Mikoyan. These were cheap pork or beef cutlet-shaped patties, which resembled industrial produced American beef burgers. Some varieties bore names of well-known Russian restaurant dishes, but they had little in common with the original dishes. <laughs> In particular, a variety of a pork patty was called, quote, Kiev-style cutlet. Since the late Soviet times, real chicken Kiev cutlets have been offered in Russia as convenience food. Introduced in Britain during 1979, Chicken Kiev was Marks & Spencer Company's first ready-made meal. It remains popular in the UK, being readily available in supermarkets and served in some restaurant chains. Uh, my UK viewers, is that true? Can you corroborate that? I have no idea if that's true. Due to his popularity, is included in the UK inflation basket. What is that? Which is composed by the Office for National Statistics for calculation of the consumer price inflation in indices. I guess that's what that is. I guess that's what that is. <laughs> Question <learned> answered. <laughs> Learning every single day. The wide popularity of Chicken Kiev as a pre-packaged meal led to the term Kiev being applied to various stuffed chicken dishes, such as leek and bacon Kiev or cheese and ham Kiev. The same dish as chicken cordon- I was about to say, that's just cordon bleu! <laughs> <laughs> like, that's- it's literally just that! <laughs> Veg 
vegetarian KMs were introduced in the UK in the 1990s. Citation needed. And our popular vegetarian convenience food. What the fuck would a vegetarian Kiev be? Like, what would be the meat equivalent in that? We'll never that... know because citation is needed. What, what would that be? Would it would it just be like tofu or something? Potato. Potato it's with just butter. A potato. Awesome. Is it? Is it? Oh no! P people are giving actual answers. Like it's just corn meat generally. I'm not sure what that is, but that sounds like some kind of meat substitute. I d I do like the idea of it just being a stick of butter, though. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, a meal for me. <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, just because you're a vegetarian doesn't mean you can take this excuse to eat another stick of butter. <laughs> but I need to eat a vegetarian give. <sighs> we'll see if we can find you one or make you one or something. <laughs> oh, it's got butter in it. It's different. Among other dishes similar to Chicken Kiev, the aforementioned Chicken Cordon Bleu, with a cheese and ham filling instead of butter, is particularly popular in the West. The recipe of, uh, Kara Dordeva Snikla, a Serbian breaded veal or pork cutlet, was inspired by Chicken Kiev. Nice. Cultural References Chicken Kiev is the name used by William Sapphire for a speech made in Kiev during August 1991 by then US President George H.W. Bush cautioning Ukrainians against, quote, suicidal nationalism. And I. I gotta be honest, I don't trust anything George H.W. Bush would have to say about any to anyone about nationalism. <laughs> True. <laughs> Suicidal nationalism is bad, except when we do it. Hey. In 2018, a bronze miniature sculpture of Chicken Kiev was placed on Horodeki Street in Kiev, near the restaurant Chicken Kiev. The sculpture became the first of a set of mini-sculptures depicting famous symbols of Kiev, placed throughout the city as part of an art project. See also. Breaded Cutlet. List of Russian dishes. 82 citations. And a lot of sources. <laughs> Very well documented meal. That makes up approximately half of the article by, like, page scroll length. <laughs> My god. My god. And now you know. Chicken Kiev. We got a compound butter. Now, now, to their credit, <laughs> now to their credit, I'm sure this was probably a pretty good steak meal. This is a foul-looking picture. <laughs> at, a, at a certain point, when you zoom in close enough on any meal, it just it starts to just <laughs> come apart at the seams. Was this delicious? I'm sure. The potatoes are maybe looking a little bit uh, undercooked, and also suffer from the same problems everything else in here, and that it's wet. It's wet. It's wet. <laughs> so is this meal creepy or wet? I'm not gonna eat my New York strip meal if it's creepy or wet. It's a good meal, madam. All right, I'll have the strip steak topped with beurre maître d'hôtel. It's wet. <laughs> These potatoes l really look like they can have a bit more color on them, though. Like, they, they, they got that nice bit of crust on, like, some of these smaller bits. Then you got, like, this one here, and it's like... That still looks a little sogged up. That could have used a bit longer in the pan or in the oven or something. Roast those fuckers a little more. The ones in the back are, like, really pale. Uh-huh. Thank you, Star Swifted, for the five gift subs. Uh, someone in chat said, In fairness, food photography is difficult as hell. Oh, don't you worry. I know. Literally every single time I've tried to take a nice-looking picture of, like, food I made, it has never come out looking quite the way I want it to. To the point where I've just started to lean into, like making it look kind of bad on purpose because like I, I know how people do like actual professional food photography they have entire setups and like equipment for like proper lighting and things like that <laughs> i don't have that i don't have the space for that i don't want that right now maybe someday it could be fun maybe someday i just get really into food photography until until then you're getting pictures of my meal <laughs> <laughs> so i get why this is a bit of a slop looking picture <laughs> Yeah, that, that, the uh, speaking of, uh, speaking of, uh, speaking of. Uh. Now, this one's a different type of dire. <laughs> I'm, I'm 
trying to figure out the plate. It looks like it's upside down. It looks like it's been burned. It looks like it has scorch marks. <laughs> it looks like it's been left out in the sun for too long, and then, like, it got rained on. Staring at this, like, clay plate, but then the, like, what looks to be plastic utensils. He here's the thing. Once again, unfortunately foul-looking picture. I would eat this. I would probably love this. I would eat this and enjoy this. Oh, extremely. <laughs> Why is someone in chat just asking claymates with a question mark? What do you mean? I said clay plate, so <laughs> I unleashed the curse. <laughs> you have to play clay plates. You have to play clay plates on, on your, your dinner table and you have to beat all of it. <laughs> all right, you must. <laughs> Served with onion rings, rye bread, compound butter with herbs and garlic, and horseradish. Like, yeah, that, that sounds good. That sounds like good skirt steak. I'd eat that. Compound butters. French beurre composé, or plural beurre composé, are mixtures of butter and supplementary ingredients. Primarily, they're used to enhance flavor in various dishes in a fashion similar to a sauce. Compound butters can be made at home or purchased commercially. A compound butter can be made by whipping additional elements such as herbs, spices, or aromatic liquids into butter. The butter is then reformed. <laughs> that just makes me think of... <laughs> I don't know why my brain immediately went to this, but it went to Fear Not Citizens. I've been re-educated, SJW Bush. <laughs> I guess it's because I've got George HW on the mind. <laughs> He's in there now. We have to <laughs> we have to contain him. The butter is then re-educated, usually in plastic wrap or parchment paper, and chilled until it's firm enough to be sliced. These butters can be melted on top of meats and vegetables, used as a spread, or used to finish various sauces. Beurre composé include beurre à la bourguignonne, garlic and parsley butter, beurre maître d'hôtel, butter with parsley and lemon juice, café de Paris butter. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Oh, <laughs> God, speaking of slop meal. It looks like baby vomit. <laughs> garlic butter and beurre au citron, lemon butter. <laughs> uh, uh, hang on, what was that one called? Café de Paris butter. Uh, not on the list, so. Uh, Café de Paris sauce is a butter-based sauce served with grilled beef. Uh, when it is served with a sliced portion, portion of an entrecote, in American English ribeye steak, or a faux filet, in English a sirloin steak, the resulting dish is known as entrecote Café de Paris. But what the fuck is it made out of? Butter. But what the fuck is it made out of? It's butter based, ma'am. I don't care about the goddamn history. You tell me what's in this shit. <laughs> Both the Café de Paris and the Entrecote groups of restaurants consider the sauces, ingredients, and methods of preparations to be a trade secret? Fuck this! <laughs> fuck off! <laughs> How fucking dare you! It's classified! <laughs> this, this is how they get you! They're upselling fucking baby vomit! They're getting you to eat this shit with cuts of meat, and they're like, Good, huh? We'll never tell you what's in it! Don't fucking trust the French! <laughs> Wait, Café de Paris butter. Quite distinct from the classic Café de Paris sauce are various compound butters, commonly referred to as Café de Paris butter. These typically contain a mixture of herbs, spices, and other condiments, such as mustard, marjoram, dill, rosemary, tarragon, paprika, capers, chives, curry powder, parsley, shallot, garlic, Worcestershire sauce, and anchovies. <sighs> all whipped into the butter. I think they just listed all the ingredients that exist. <laughs> this is a butter where someone dumped, like, the entirety of their spice cabinet into it. Their urban spice cabinet fell into the butter, and they're like, Ah, oh, shit, better add some mustard and capers and anchovies. <laughs> Resulting compound butter is shaped into a roll using aluminum foil and chilled. When the dish is served, a piece of the butter is sliced off and allowed to melt on the hot meat. Hashtag <laughs> hot meat. We're not we're not legally allowed to tell you what's in the, what's in the sauce. The butter though. Everything's in it. 
It's all in there. <laughs> cookie butter! Oh, I could go for some cookie butter. <laughs> I had cookie butter once. It was pretty goddamn good. Yummy. Ah. Cookie butter. Uh, Dutch speculus pasta. I probably pronounced that horribly wrong. Uh, Danish truffel masse. Probably also pronounced that one wrong. That's okay. Is a food paste made primarily from speculus cookie crumbs. Speculus is a type of cookie. Okay. <laughs> I think I remember the word speculus coming up in some way last time. And I was like, what does speculus mean? What kind of adjective is that? I think it might have been when we were watching Bake Off. Oh my god, it, maybe it was? Because we were both like, it's, it's something. We don't know what it is. <laughs> Speculus finger! <laughs> that, that famous thing that was found in the game files for Yoshi's Cookie but never implemented. <laughs> Such as Biscoff in the United States and UK. Fat, such as vegetable oil, condensed milk or butter, flour, and sugar. The ingredients are mixed until it becomes spreadable on a sandwich. In countries like Belgium, the Netherlands, and France, it is a common alternative to nut butter and chocolate spread. Huh. Main ingredients, spice cookie, fat, and sugar. Variations, other crumbly cakes, additional ingredients, cocoa, liquor, coconut, oats, and jams. Jam. Yeah. Mm. Throw some jams in there. <laughs> oh. yeah. Sucrose finger is another good one. Big fan of that one. <laughs> the idea is generally attributed to Oma Wapsi, pseudonym of the Dutch Rita, who placed the recipe on her website in 2002. Who is the Dutch Rita? Who's Rita? <laughs> The idea spread widely uh, in part of a Belgian TV inventor show <laughs> called De Bedenkers. De Bedenkers. <laughs> De Bedenkers. <laughs> De Bedenkers. De Bedenkers. De Bedenkers. De Bedenkers. The inventors. Two people presented a com competing recipe to make it a spreadable product out of speculoos cookies. Chef Danny DeMayer, who already filed a patent at the time, and Els Sheppers. Lotus, the biggest brand of speculoos, known as Biscoff in the U.S. cookies, brought her idea and or bought her idea and brought it to market. They also bought DeMayer's patent in 2009 so as to seal the market. Ah, I see. On January 20th, 2011, a court of commerce in Ghent, Belgium, denied the patent because the recipe had already been published on a Dutch website prior to its production. Ah! Get I got him! him. Mm. Fucking get him, let's go. Today, with the monopoly lifted, cookie butter is available under many brands, including Lotus Biscoff and Trader Joe's Speculoos Cookie Butter. I think the Trader Joe one is the one that I tried, because I tried it when I was in the States, visiting a pal. That makes sense. In the United States. The spread gained a cult following in the U.S. in 2015. It is often served during holidays. Is it? <laughs> well, there's, is a it? there's a citation there! They got me, then! Lotus Biscoff Cookie Butter is the most recognized brand. However, Trader Joe's Speculoos Cookie Butter is quite popular as well. Eh, various types. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a bunch of different ones. In Scandinavia, a different kind of cookie butter has been used to make confectionery cakes for many years. It usually has a very thick consistency and is flavored with cocoa and liquor. Citation needed. In Sweden, cookie butter is the main ingredient in... punch rolls. A Swedish small cylindrical pastry covered in green marzipan. The buttery paste is flavored with cocoa and punch specific type of alcoholic liquor and punch popular in Sweden and Finland. Wrapped in a thin sheet of marzipan and dipped in dark chocolate. The marzipan is usually colored brightly green. Citation needed. In Denmark, 
Cookie butter is known as trofelmas and is used for many traditional confectionery cakes such as Studenterbrod, uh, Romkulger, known as Troffler in some parts of the country, and Trestemer, a bit similar to the Swedish Damsjagar, on sale in most bakeries. I'm, I'm so sorry to anyone from these countries listening to me butcher these pronunciations, but I need you to know, your best. in the same way it's probably fun for you to pronounce things wrong in English on purpose, it's kind of fun for me to do this. <laughs> The cookie butter is mostly flavored with cocoa and often includes other types of crumbled cakes. It is sometimes mixed with shredded coconut, rolled oats, or jams. For the jam, apricot or raspberry is the preferred ingredient. Three fucking citations! Eat your fucking hearts out, Scandinavia and Sweden. Get owned! <laughs> <laughs> this one? These, these look like fucking, uh... Like, weird, smoothed-out version of, like, Dolnads, or Dolnad as I even pronounce them. They're, like, the the Greek, uh, sometimes other similar, like, nearby Middle Eastern countries where it's, like, you know, you got uh, rice and stuff wrapped in, uh, like, grape leaf. It but... looks like if you ask someone who had never heard of sushi to make a sushi. <laughs> they look like someone's low-res background food asset for a video game. Yeah! <laughs> They look- they look a little like Star Trek food. Little bit. They- oh my fucking god. This literally looks like a plate of shapes Captain Kirk would be eating. Oh my god! <laughs> That's why I said it! <laughs> it's still so funny to me that, like, <laughs> Star Trek original series, all the food is them just eating, like, weird shapes off of a plate, and then every series after that, they were just like, what if we used our, like, amazing food technology to make real food? <laughs> So that we don't just have to keep giving our actors shapes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it's so funny compared, like comparison-wise, Deep Space Nine. A big like character point of Captain Cisco is that he likes cooking. He's a really good chef. <laughs> He's not out here eating like fucking star bits from Mario Galaxy. <laughs> so, chunks, huh? Exposing the cocoa and rum-flavored cookie butter interior. Is this the lad under TOS? It is now. Hooray! Uh, balls. You know him, you love him, that's right. Ball. Oh, I want to eat one of those. <laughs> they what do. if I just ordered munchkin at 6 p.m.? You could. Nothing's stopping you. My wallet is stopping me. That's and fair. And my pride. That's, that's a pretty, that's a good enough reason as any. <laughs> How much would it cost, though? This is, this is a geode snack. This is a geode you can eat. See also, list of cookies, petit beurre, uh, butter cookie, and speculas. Uh, what else have we got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 more on the list. What the fuck is torpedo dessert? What? Oh, you know. Oh, I shan't peek. Oh, I won't. I won't spoil myself. <laughs> I gotta get up and have another stretch. It's. I. I told myself, "What the fuck do you mean?" It's been in like almost an hour, and then I remembered how fucking long Chicken Kiev was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one was a marathon. My God. I wonder how long these other ones are gonna be. <laughs> I suppose we'll have to see. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna get up. Have a stretch, get myself uh, some more to drink, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm gonna toss on the ads while I'm away, which means it's the perfect opportunity for you to get up. Get yourself a stretch, maybe a drink or a snack or something like that. Take care of yourselves. We'll be back in a couple of minutes.
Are you saying hey or egg? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know, my beloved? I would! That's why I asked! <laughs> <laughs> I was saying hey. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Man, this is unrelated. I guess it's related to hey. I wish I could fucking say hey in the voice of like the NPCs from Sonic 06. Hey. It's like. Oh my god, same. Hey. Kind of like that, but not really. Also, Katie! Hi, Katie! Thank you for the resub. I hope you've been doing well, my friend! Hey. Uh, Let's get back to butter. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get back to butter soon. I've made a vow. What? Oh, oh, Holly, did you not check our chat? No, I was on the toilet. Oh, uh, that explains it. Don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you that one RT for converting from a prime sub to a regular tier one. Hell yeah. Thank you very much. Let's croissant. Oh my fucking god. After I said, oh yeah, the chicken Kiev one. That sure was a long one. Uh, <laughs> oh no, we've activated the curse. <laughs> completely forgetting that, yeah, fucking of course the croissant article is going to be long. This is a noteworthy pastry. <laughs> Stop. I heard of it. I know these ones. I heard of it. I seen it. I seen this one on the internet. A croissant is a buttery, flaky French viennoiserie pastry inspired by the shape of the Austrian kipferl, but using the French yeast leavened laminated dough. Croissants are named for their historical crescent shape. The dough is layered with butter, uh, rolled and folded several times in succession, then rolled into a thin sheet in a technique called laminating. Uh, the process results in a layered, flaky texture similar to a puff pastry. I, I do appreciate everyone in the chat immediately going for the fucking Carl Weezer jokes. Um, yes, are you going to finish that croissant? Uh... I'll have one more, and then that'll be it. <laughs> crescent-shaped breads have been made since the Renaissance, and crescent-shaped cakes possibly since antiquity, but using brioche dough. I almost misread that as bionicle dough. I'm... <laughs> so no! Is... Don't turn me into a bread! No! <laughs> Something is happening to my reading comprehension tonight. There's been a change in my DNA. Uh... Oh, okay, I guess that song just abruptly cuts off and changes. Sure. The end. Uh, Kipferls have long been a staple of Austrian and French bakeries and patisseries. The modern croissant was developed in the early 20th century when French bakers replaced the brioche dough of the Kipferl with a yeast-leavened laminated dough. In the early 1970s, the development of factory-made frozen, preformed but unbaked dough made them into a fast food that could be freshly baked by unskilled labor. Uh, the Croissant Bakery, notably the La Croissanterie chain, was a French response to American-style fast food. And of 2008, 30-40% to of the croissants sold in French bakeries and patisseries were baked from frozen dough. Croissants are a common part of a continental breakfast in many European countries. Why is it called a continental breakfast? I've never known that. The term originated in Britain in the mid-19th century, first used in 1896 public hygiene book, The Sanitarian, in which continent refers to the countries of mainland Europe, though the idea had been around a few decades as American hotels endeavored to appeal to the changing tastes of the emerging middle class and European travelers visiting America. The term refers to the type of breakfast found in places such as France and the Mediterranean, which is lighter and more delicate than the type of than the typical full English breakfast which tends to consist of a large... Yeah, I know that, but I still don't understand why it's called Continental. Like, anything from a fucking continent can be Continental. What do you mean? <laughs> Hang on, question in chat. 
Uh, Bionicle lore stream when this has been discussed, the answer is as soon as Holly figures out how much she can do without getting copyright stricken? Literally no! I don't know why I've seen multiple people go, oh yeah, the issue with the Bionicle stream is copyright, right? You're trying to like, see how you can get around copyright to the stream? No! The reason the Bionicle lore stream hasn't happened is it's gonna take me a long fucking time to make it the kind of presentation I want it to be! I'm literally working my fucking ass off whenever I have the energy to like, make this a fucking show! <laughs> Lego is historically extremely fucking lax <laughs> about copyright when it comes to Bionicle. Literally all of the movies are just on fucking YouTube. <laughs> they let people save and host like every single piece of Bionicle media ever made on a website called the Biomedia Project, and LEGO has said they will never try to take it down unless they're specifically charging people to access any of the stuff there. <laughs> I... <laughs> I want to go in-depth with all the shit in there to make it as interesting and entertaining as possible, while also not just having it be like a fucking white screen with text on it type of, like, PowerPoint presentation. It's gonna be a bit. And also, I want to eventually commission people for, like, fucking graphics and stuff, and that's gonna take time and money as well, so, like... <laughs> the reason why it hasn't happened yet is because it's gonna take a while to put together, and I've got other things I'm doing in the meantime, unfortunately. <laughs> this has nothing to do with butter. <laughs> Not yet. We don't know what's gonna go in the final presentation. Maybe Butter will be involved somehow. I mean... I don't know if I should say it. I, I can say this vaguely and no one will know what I'm fucking talking about. Scrooge McDuck is in the presentation. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> and I don't just mean, oh, you know, because Lego makes money off of it, right? No, 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 no. Scrooge McDuck is canon. You'll see. I'm excited know almost nothing about Bionicle, so I am legitimately going to learn so much from the Bionicle stream. <laughs> I still don't understand why this is called Continental. Because, like, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's it's different from the English. It's like the things from all around the continent. It's like, say that about fucking anything, though. You can say that about anything. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, you see, it's on a continent. I guess. I guess. That's the end of my sentence. Origin and history. The Kipferl. The origin of the, the... The origin, not origin, of the croissant. Uh, can be dated back to at least 13th century in Austria and came in various shapes. To, to all the people in chat asking, wait, which Bionicle character is Scrooge McDuck? I don't mean there is a character in Bionicle that is like Scrooge McDuck. I mean, Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting sidetracked. There's so much fucking Quasar article here. <sighs> the kip furl can be made plain or with nuts or other fillings. Some consider the rugelach a form of kip furl. The, big, the birth of the croissant itself, it is the adaptation from the, 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 the plainer form of kip furl. Before the invention of viennoiseries, uh, can be dated to at least 1839, some say 1838, uh, when an Austrian artillery officer, August Zang, founded a Viennese bakery, Boulangerie Viennoise, at 92 Rue de Richelieu in Paris. This, I, it, it feels so fucking weird going into, like, French reading mode and then just saying Paris is Paris instead of Paris, but, like, I'm not gonna give them the fucking satisfaction. Do you, do you remember that, um, clip of Toby Fox speaking Japanese where it just sounds like his voice turns into another font when he reads a loan word at one point. Right, yeah, when he, he just goes like, Toho Project, or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Makes me think of that. Uh -huh. that's good, that's good. Uh, that's, that's how I feel going from English to French sometimes. <laughs> yeah! There, there's something about switching languages that does that to your brain. Mm-hmm. This bakery, which served Viennese specialties including the Kip Furl and the Vienna Loaf, quickly became popular and inspired French imitators and the concept, if not the term, of viennoiserie, 20th century term for supposedly Vienna-style pastries. 
The French version of the Kip Furl was named for its crescent, or croissant, shape, and has become a universally identifiable shape across the world. Citation meat. <laughs> They don't know what a crescent is. They don't know. They don't even know. You know what this is? This is going to be very specific and very silly, but I'm going to say it anyway. Go for it. I love you. This is the actual wiki version of... It is possible that Donatella is Italian. Oh! <laughs> this is something that's so fucking obvious and... Yeah, duh. But you can't link to one specific citation that, like, <laughs> says it. So you got a citation needed. People know that it is a crescent because it is shaped like a crescent. Citation needed. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvain Claudius Goy, a French chef, was the first to make croissant with yeast leavened laminated dough. Alan Davidson, editor of the Oxford Companion to Food, found no printed recipe for the present day croissant in any French recipe book before the early 20th century. The earliest French reference to a croissant he found was among the, quote, fantasy or luxury breads in Payens des Substances Alimentaires, 1853. Uh, however, early recipes for non-laminated croissants can be found in the 19th century, and at least one reference to croissants as an established French bread appeared as early as 1850. Zhang himself returned to Austria in 1848 to become a press magnate, but the bakery remained popular for some time afterwards. And was mentioned in several works of the time. Quote, The same M. Zank, uh, which is how they spelled it in the article. They spelled it wrong. They called him Stank! They called him Stank! Stank! Founded around 1830. Uh, again, wrong. <laughs> in Paris, the famous boulangerie viennoise. Several sources... This article is wrong on purpose. For fun. <laughs> Several sources praise this bakery's products. Paris is of exquisite delicacy, and in particular, the succulent products of the Boulangerie Viennoise, which seem to us as fine as if it came from the Viennese bakery on the Rue de Richelieu. By 1869, the croissant was well established enough to be mentioned as a breakfast staple. In 1872, Charles Dickens wrote in his periodical, All the Year Round, of, quote, the workmen's pain de menage and the soldiers' pain de munition to the daily croissant on the boudoir table. I like reading it in an anglicized voice when it's an American. Charles Dickens was an American, was he? Was he? Hang on. Who am I thinking of if Charles Dickens is from the UK? Charles Dickens, it says, is English, so I'm assuming he's from England. He's from England. Who am I thinking he's of? from England. What famous author from America am I thinking of that I mix up with Charles Dickens? It's probably Mark Twain. It's probably Mark Twain. So many people in chat are saying Mark Twain, and it's probably Mark Twain. <laughs> the Mark Twain comes up in the uh, people also search for when you search Charles Dickens. However, also Herman Melville comes up, and Herman Melville is Mark is trending? What did Herman Melville do? Puzz? I'm about to ask you something in complete confidence that's probably going to embarrass me. Who the fuck is Herman Melville? I'm looking that up too, my love. It's okay. <laughs> what did he do? Should I care? <laughs> um, I, I don't see why he is trending. Uh, he, he did die in 1891, so I'm not sure if anything new could have come out. <laughs> he fucking wrote Moby Dick. That's embarrassing. Moby Dick, man. <laughs> Moby Dick is literally like a story that's very close to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and I forgot that he wrote it. <laughs> He's Mr. Dick. <laughs> That's Dick himself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> the puff pastry technique that now characterizes <laughs> the croissant was already mentioned in the late 17th century when La Varenne's Le Cuisinier Francois gave a recipe for it in 1860. Sorry, sign in chat just said, she moby on my dick till I Herman, and I hate that I read that, and uh, my immediate thought was, why no her woman? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you said that before I picked up my tea to sip it. <laughs> Are you sipping your tea? Are you sipping your tea? I'm about to. 
boobs! <laughs> Did I get you? Right as I was lifting it up to my mouth. Fuck! I almost did it. <laughs> <laughs> Holly, I have three different screens in front of me. Don't make me take right now. Fair. <laughs> in three different screens and a cat. In the 1680 and possibly earlier edition. Also, yeah, I, people point it out sometimes, but I do really like when you laugh so hard. It sounds like you're trilling like a bird. <laughs> It was typically used not on its own, but for shells holding other ingredients, <laughs> as in Vanova. <laughs> it does not appear to be mentioned in relation to the croissant till the 20th century. <laughs> I need to calm down. Uh huh. <laughs> No, this is a kip furl. Oh, I see. I like this kip furl that looks like a shramp. It, it looks a little bit like a scrimp, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a little scrimped up. Honey, we're never getting through this fucking croissant article. We're going to die. We're going to die. <laughs> uh, this is all about variants and how you make them. Which is interesting. Oh my god, this is good tea. Oh, hell yeah. Let's go. about this? Let's put croissant on the back burner. What if we come back to croissant at the end and that'll be the last hurrah? I was gonna say, you know what? Perfect segue into the eventual pastry stream. There you go. <laughs> Speaking of pastry. Danish pastry. Hello, Holly. You're eating too many marshmallows and you don't feel well. Easy fix. Stop eating marshmallows. Give them to me. <laughs> Literally so... <laughs> well, don't do that one. <laughs> ah, Danish pastry. A Danish pastry, sometimes shortened to just Danish, especially in American English, is a multi-layered, laminated, a sweet pastry uh, in the Viennoiserie tradition. The concept was brought to Denmark by Austrian bakers, where the recipe was partly changed and accommodated by the Danes to their liking, and has since developed into a Danish specialty. Like other Viennoiserie paintings, such as croissants, it is a variant of puff pastry made of laminated yeast-leavened dough that creates a layered texture. Danish pastries were brought with immigrants to the United States, where they're often topped with fruit or cream cheese filling, and are now popular around the world. I fucking love Danishes. Danishes is good. Oh, I could go for a Danish! My favorite is, uh, either lemon or cherry. I love cherry and lemon danishes. They're my favorite kinds. But there's so many good kinds. Like, I I think it's hard to go wrong with a danish. What does laminated mean in pastry context? Uh, like, fold it over itself a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you know uh, how uh, Japanese katanas are made by folding the sheet metal over itself thousands of times? Uh, pastries work much the same way. This is the Zyborn that danish. But with dough and butter, and then you can eat it at the end, which they don't usually recommend with katanas. Imagine four butter at the edge of a cliff. <laughs> How did we have the same fucking brain? Well, easy, Frankie. We're both fucking geniuses. It's that simple. That's true. Butter and steel are the same. They're effectively the same. In the, in the use cases, you would want either of them. The logic is sound. Uh, katanas are famous for being flaky, by the way. <laughs> A delicious flaky katana. Take a big bite, but actually don't do that. Literally don't. Composition. Danish pastry is made of yeast leavened dough of wheat flour, milk, eggs, sugar, and large amounts of butter or margarine. A yeast dough, excuse me. Yeast dough is rolled out thinly, covered with thin slices of butter between the layers of dough, and then the dough is folded and rolled several times, creating 27 layers. If necessary, the dough is chilled between foldings to ease handling. The process of rolling, buttering, folding, and chilling is repeated multiple times to create a multi-layered dough that becomes airy and crispy on the outside, but also rich and buttery. One of these days, Holly will do enough Wikipedia food list streams for us to determine the components of the perfect meal. I already know what that is. It's, uh, take some 
broccoli and you fry it in garlic and oil. There you oh, go. I want it! There you go. <laughs> Do whatever the fuck else you want with it. <laughs> you can add you can make a pasta with it. You can make some other kind of sauce with the base you got there, etc. etc. There you go. <laughs> you got it. it in my mind. And then after that you have a slice of pie. It's that simple. Oh. It's that simple. It's that simple. Uh Butter is the traditional fat used in Danish pastry. But industrial but in industrial production, less expensive fats are often used such as hydrogenated sunflower oil. Terminology. I'm just Yeah. Sorry to, to interrupt just a Go quick ahead. second. I just we've watched too much bake up. I'm just imagining Mel and Sue pronouncing as Danish <laughs> And then saying some dumb shit in Danish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I miss them every day. Uh-huh. Good for them. This is like an almond that got cut in a certain way, but from like this distance with the color they got on it, it does look kind of like a sliced olive. It does say, it's a little olive. It does look a bit like they put olives on this Danish. I can't believe I almost missed butter stream and god. Listen, ol olives and bread? <laughs> Yummy. Olive and Danish? Uh, Jerry's out. <laughs> Jerry's out on that one. Oh, Jerry, come back soon. We missed you, Jerry. Thank you, Twinking, for the 29-month resub. Don't worry. Uh, some of the articles have been fucking long, so you haven't missed too much. Thank you, Twinking, for the good name. Good name, by the way. All right. Uh, in Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish, the term for Danish pastry is uh, wienerbrod, uh, meaning Viennese bread. Not not wiener as in, like, the, the, the type of sausage. Turns out. Turns out. The same etymology is also the origin of the Finnish uh, vineri and Estonian vini, uh, vini sai, Viennese pastry. In Vienna, the Danish pastry is called the Copenhagener plunder, referring to Copenhagen or the Danisher plunder. History. The origin of the Danish pastry is often ascribed to a strike amongst bakery workers in Denmark in 1850. Huh. The strike caused bakery owners to hire workers from abroad. Ah, they hired scabs. Okay. Uh, among That'll them, do it. Among them, several Austrian bakers who brought along new baking traditions and pastry recipes. So who's to say if it was bad or good then? <laughs> the Austrian pastry of uh, Plundergebak soon became popular in Denmark. And after the labor disputes ended, Danish bakers adopted the Austrian recipes, adjusting them to their own liking and traditions by increasing the amount of egg and fat, for example. You know, these the, the, these pastries from Austria are pretty good, but what if we put more fucking butter in it? That's on par for this stream. The development resulted in what is now known as the Danish pastry. One of the baking techniques and traditions that the Austrian bakers brought with them was the Viennese lamination technique. Citation needed. Due to such novelties, the Danes called the pastry Wienerbrod, or Vienna bread, and as mentioned, that name is still used in Northern Europe today. At the time, almost all baked goods in Denmark were given exotic names. Citation needed. Followed by a what? Followed by a citation? Wh More? Are, are you fucking insatiable? Is this not enough for you? <laughs> Denmark. Danish Denmark. Denmark. Danish pastries as consumed in Denmark have different shapes and names. Some are topped with chocolate, pearl sugar, uh, glacé icing, and or slivered nuts, which I almost misread as silvered nuts. And they may be stuffed with a variety of ingredients such as jam or per- Not perseveres! Preserves! I'm fucking losing it tonight! I'm losing my ability to read! It's okay, honey, it's okay. I'm I'm rubbing your shoulders like you're going back into the box and we're gonna get through this. <laughs> Usually apple or prune. Please do not put colloidal silver on your nuts. It'll turn you into Zavala before you know it. Guardian, I've yeah. gained the power to eat a Danish pastry. It's quite good. Uh, usually apple or prune, uh, romance, marzipan, and or custard. Shapes are numerous, including circles with filling in the middle, known in Denmark as... A spandaus, figure eights, spirals known as snails, and the pretzel-like kringles. <sighs> Varieties. <laughs> in Sweden, 
Danish pastry is typically made in the Spendauer style, often with vanilla custard. In the UK, various ingredients such as jam, custard, apricots, cherries, raisins, flaked almonds, pecans, or caramelized toffee are placed on or within sections of divided dough, which is then baked. Cardamom is often added to increase the aromatic sense of sweetness. Uh, in the US, Danishes are typically given a topping of fruit or sweetened cream cheese prior to baking. Danishes with nuts on them are also popular there and in Sweden, where often icing and sometimes powdered sugar and chocolate spritzing are also added. In Argentina, they are usually filled with dulce de leche or dulce de membrillo, or membrillo, sorry, which is quince cheese made of the quince fruit. I had it zoomed in. I forgot I had it zoomed in. And it just... <laughs> cube. Are you looking at the cube? The fun cannot be halted. <laughs> Here's a Kringle for you. Oh, I want to eat it. Me too, honey. Here's some Danish pastries in Denmark. Oh, I want to eat them all. Me too, honey. Uh, here's a pecan and maple Danish sold in the UK. Oh, it's got maple. I want to eat it. Me too. I had like one like this today, but instead of pecan and maple, it was apple preserves and like little sugar <gasps> crystals. It was good. Smile. I want to eat it. I know you do. Uh... Facturas, again with the cube in it, and Danish pastries in the Philippines. Damn, they do look oh, good. I want to eat them. I want to eat them. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> United States. United States. United States. United States. United States. Super. Danish pastry was brought to the United States by Danish immigrants. Uh, Lord C. Kitling. Uh, or kilting, sorry, or clitting, of Lesu, popularized Danish pastry in the U.S. around 1915 to 20. According to Klitting, he made Danish pastry for the wedding of President Woodrow Wilson in December 1915, touted the world to promote his product, and was featured in such 1920s periodicals as the Natural Bake, National Baker, not natural, the Baker's Helper, and the Baker's. There's nothing Meatly. natural about this bake. The, there's nothing natural about baking in general. It's very much a man-made thing. <laughs> You know, you raise a compelling point there, actually. <laughs> Clitting briefly had his own Danish culinary studio at 146 Fifth Avenue in New York City. Herman Gertner, good name, owned a chain of New York City restaurants and has bought and brought Clitting to New York City to sell Danish pastry. Gertner's obituary in the January 23rd, 1962, the New York Times. At one point during his career, Mr. Gertner befriended a Danish baker who convinced him that Danish pastry might be well received in New York. Uh, Mr. Gertner began serving the pastry in his restaurant, and it immediately was a success. Cartoon controversy? Hold on. What? Huh? During the Jilin's Postin Muhammad cartoons controversy in 2006, several religious Iranian groups advocated changing the name of the highly popular Danish. Uh... Trini Denmarki, given its name association with the source country of the offending cartoons. The Association of Iranian Confectionery Manufacturing designated Roses of the Prophet Muhammad as the new name for Danish is made in the country as of the 15th of February 2006, although compliance with the proposed name and bakeries were mixed and short-lived. Related to this, many protesters in several Muslim countries, angered by the pictures of Muhammad, boycotted Danish goods. Roses of Muhammad's, literally Muhammad flower in Persian, is a traditional per Persian synonym for a variety of pink rose flowering shrub. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Oh man, they freedom fries it? I mean, there's a little bit more to it than the whole freedom fries thing. The freedom fried things was kind of just a reaction as like, oh, fuck the French in general or whatever. Like, this is at least like about an insensitive a portrayal of a religious issue, figure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, an, an interesting way of expressing displeasure about that, though. So we just did Danish pastry. Did I do the whole article? I did, right. It, it ended at cartoon controversy. Okay, so next. Deep fried butter. 
Oh, baby, we're going to the state fair! What? It's no, it's very much an American type, type snack, type meal, type fair. Now I've heard of this before. Like I've heard of this thing existing. So this isn't a what, as in like, oh, this is a thing people do. But at the same time, this is a what, as in this is a thing people do. A little bit. People here also have that reaction. I I had it described to me as yeah, it's fair food shit, which yeah, that makes sense. Got a new car and it is yellow like a butter. Wonderful <laughs> how the world works. Congratulations on your butter car! Thank you for the tip! <sighs> it's more of a gimmick than anything. Right, again, fair food. Yeah. State state fairs love to fry a thing and give it to you to eat. Deep fried butter is a snack food made of butter coated with a batter or breading and then deep Okay! That's how they do it. I was just like, but if you stick a stick of butter in the deep fryer, it will melt into all the fat that's already there. It's coated. It's fucking yeah. coated. <laughs> the dish has often been served at fairs in the U.S., among them the State Fair of Texas in Dallas, Texas, the South Carolina State Fair, and the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines, Iowa. Fried butter is a similar dish, for which recipes exist dating to the 17th century. Citation needed. History. United States. Abel Gonzalez Jr., also known as Fried Jesus of Dallas, Texas, invented deep fried butter. Fried Jesus. Fried Jesus. He came out of that cave three days later and he was like, put me in that deep fat fryer and they did it to that old man they did. <laughs> I remember it from Bibble. Serving it at the 2009 State Fair of Texas in Dallas, Texas, prepared using frozen battered butter, it was awarded the most creative food prize at that time? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What fucking competition was- no, no discredit to Fried Jesus here. What competition was he up against that- Well, I just took some butter and put it in the fryer. Was the, that one most creative food prize. It was just that good. <sighs> a version of deep fried butter on a stick debuted at the Iowa State Fair in 2011, which was prepared using frozen butter dipped in a honey and cinnamon flavored batter, deep fried until brown, and then topped with confectioner's sugar glaze. This concoction on a stick was invented by Larry Fight. He's gonna. Larry's gonna fucking fight for this butter. An entrepreneur and concessionaire at the fair. Au contraire, mon frere. Deep fried butter has also been served on a stick at the State Fair of Texas. <laughs> in 2011, at the Orange County Fair in Costa Mesa, California, deep fried butter was paired with chocolate covered bacon and dubbed the Coronary Combo! America oh. loves this shit. Oh, jeez. ABC News made a comparison regarding the pricing of this food pairing, stating, quote, the $10.50 pricing rivaled some health plan's co-payments for a visit to the cardiologist. The dish has also been served at other events and venues, such as the State Fair of Virginia and the Music Fest Music Festival in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Canada. The debut of Deep Fried Butter in 2010. Wait. The debut of deep fried butter in 2010 at the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto, Canada may have led to a rise in attendance at the event. I like that the music fucking stopped for this. <laughs> Wait, this is important. We need to hear it. Moment of terror. During the 18-day event in 2010, the concession stand purveying the dish sold 9,000 orders, which equated to 36,000 individual deep fried butter balls using 800 pounds of butter. The dish was served in portions of four balls at the event. Imagine four balls at the edge of a, fit of a state fair! I guess it's not a state fair if it's in Toronto. That's not a state, it's a province. <laughs> Imagine four balls at the edge of a national exhibition. The dish was served in portions of four balls at the event, which totaled 315 calories. Okay. I'm fucking haunted. I gotta turn the... The music back on. Where is... Uh... Oh, wait, no! The playlist stopped. I feel like if I listen to more of this fucking playlist, I'm gonna lose my goddamn gourd. Let's put on some <laughs> different music. 
Here we go. Let's listen to this. Oh, this is music for thinking about butter. <laughs> In retrospect, I'm not really sure why I did that to myself, just the same song over and over again. <laughs> but it was pretty fucking funny, you gotta admit. <laughs> you did it for the bit. I got, I got you all so good, you gotta admit. I just had to get myself in the crossfire. <laughs> it's what you gotta do sometimes for the bit. Food signage for deep fried butter and other foods at the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto. You know, I've never been to this. Because I've never really spent much time in Toronto, but that's beside the point. Uh, you never noticed it was one song? <laughs> I mean, it was different remixes of the same song! <laughs> it's mid-TBH. I don't know if you mean the National Exhibition, or if you mean the deep-fried butter, but I, I believe you for either of those. <laughs> Maybe both. In 2011 in Edinburgh, Scotland, a pub named The Fiddler's Elbow served a dessert named Braveheart Butter Bombs <laughs> that consisted of deep-fried butter served with ice cream infused with iron brew and coulis. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Some critics in, Evan in Edinburgh have referred to deep-fried butter as, quote, coronary on a plate. But chefs at the pub have stated that when consumed in moderation, it, quote, should be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's gonna fucking top that. This stream should be okay. <laughs> yeah, probably fine, right? Seems pretty cool. <laughs> the pub also planned on offering a variation using whiskey in place of iron brew. <laughs> <laughs> because of course they were. <laughs> Citation needed? No, no, no. Citation very clearly provided. <laughs> How do you eat this? You assume one bite equals hot butter explosion? That's a question I've been too afraid to ask, and quite frankly, I'm okay with not knowing. <laughs> Characteristics. Deep fried butter's flavor was compared to that of French toast, and described as tasting like, quote, the most buttery bread you've ever had. I wonder why. You know what? I would try one. You, you know, I guess I would too. The Scots do I deep fried Mars bars. They have no right to talk. Deep fried Mars bars are also in Canada and the US. That's, that's a thing in multiple places. I, I'm pretty sure if folks are out there deep frying shit, chocolate bars is a thing they're doing. Yeah. ABC News called it a, quote, artery clogging snack. It's. Is this. Is this the first confirmed Paula Dean mention in both of these streams? I think so. Is this the first official Paula Dean mention? It took deep fried butter for them to fucking mention her? Oh! <laughs> You're all cursed now, by the way. Celebrity chef Paula Dean. <laughs> when butter is afoot, you're never safe from a random Paula Dean event. Published a recipe for fried butter balls, which uses a blend of cream cheese and butter that is frozen, coated, frozen again, and then deep fried. The cooking time in this recipe is short. Only 10 to 15 sec- 10 to 15 seconds! Whereupon the product attains a quote light golden color. Don't you want to try known racist Paula Deen's delicious cream cheese and butter balls? Fuck, dude. <laughs> Cross section of deep fried butter at the State Fair of Texas 2010. That's fucking foul what is in there. I don't want to look at that no more. The fact that it's described as a cross-section is haunting. Also, I'm going to be right back in, like, two seconds. Gotcha, gotcha. The inside of that is looking like snot and something else. <laughs> With how many jokes I've made about nut, I don't know why I'm just not mentioning it outright, but... <laughs> Character... No, I just read characteristics. Fried butter... Ah, oh. fried butter is a similar dish for which recipes exist dating to the 17th century. The first known recipe for fried butter dates to 1615. <laughs> 
fried butter was documented in the cookbook, The Art of Cookery Made Plain, plain and Easy in 1747. The recipe entailed soaking butter in salted water for a few hours, placing it on a rotisserie, or as they say, spit it, covering with breadcrumbs and nutmeg, and roasting it under a low fire, while continuously covering it with egg yolks and additional breadcrumbs. Oysters were recommended to accompany the dish. <laughs> Cram a stick of butter on your rotisserie. Slather that shit in eggs. Eat it with oysters. <laughs> Things were fucking dire in the 17th century. Things. Those were the bad old days. <laughs> I, I have to fucking wait for Puss to get back. She has to know. She has to know. She has to know. She needs to know. <laughs> <laughs> this was written by a deep sea creature! <laughs> I'm going to die! You're all going to fucking kill me! <laughs> I'm a headache from laughing too hard! <laughs> I drink a water. Ah. Whew. <laughs> so how are you doing? <laughs> this one at least looks okay visually. It just looks kind of like a weird donut hole. You know, it took me so many fucking years to realize that donut holes... Um... Wait, no, they actually kind of, they, they are sometimes made out of, like, the whole bit cut out. If it's, like, if you cut out a round shape, then yeah, but also sometimes donuts are, like, rolled up instead of, uh, like, like a shape cut out. So I guess it depends on the type of donuts being made. So th the point being, whole. I feel like there was more I was going to say, and I just didn't, so <laughs> please enjoy. <laughs> enjoying you're back okay you need to fucking hear this you need to hear this okay, fried butter okay. recipe from 1747 the recipe entails soaking butter in salted water for a few hours placing it on a rotisserie quote spit it covering it with breadcrumbs and nutmeg roasting it under a low fire while continuously covering it with egg yolks and additional breadcrumbs oysters were recommended to accompany the dish I love history. <laughs> Things were fucking bad in the 17th century, dude. <laughs> they really were. Oh, I'm so glad I got to tell that to you. <laughs> also, you can fry Coca-Cola, I guess. Yeah, that sounds right. Moving on. Egg butter. Egg butter is a mixture of butter and chopped hard-boiled eggs. That's it. This picture is so small! It's so little! This picture is so small! This picture is tiny! Uh, ah! <laughs> I forgot I had it zipped in! This is a slop and chop brook type of picture! <laughs> Uh, this is a texture you would find in the files of an N64 game! Yeah, this is like a test image they put in to see how the textures were gonna look. <laughs> it's an extremely unidentified fucking thing. This is a background used in a test level for Smash Bros. 64. <laughs> Mario's 64 bit sees this on a wall? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Uh, it's just butter and hard-boiled eggs. Well-known spread in Finnish and Estonian cuisine. In Finland, egg butter is typically spread over hot Karelian pastries, which look like that. In Estonia, egg butter and dark rye bread are traditionally included in the Easter Sunday meal. F fucking short and to the point. Egg butter is eggs and butter. There you go. We're going home. <laughs> Another fast one! Garlic butter! That's the same picture! <laughs> it's back! It's back! It's back! It's, it's back! It's back! It's back! It's back! Let's go! Uh, 
<laughs> Live screenshot of my meal. Oh, I, I genuinely kind of love this, though. This was just uploaded by some wiki user. It's not like a photo they found. It's just, I took this picture. <laughs> I love it when that happens, unironically. Honestly, yeah. If if it wasn't for the fact that I fucked up my meal on purpose, <laughs> image-wise, that's the kind of image that I would feel okay with being like, yeah, I would just upload this somewhere to be like, this is an example of, of a thing. Uh... Most of them are probably like that. Food photography is hard. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. I, I know. Don't worry. <laughs> it's not me being like, oh, they should have simply done it better. I understand. It's just still funny. <laughs> Garlic butter. Also known as beurre à la bourguignonne. is compound butter used as a flavoring for many dishes or as a condiment. It is composed of butter and garlic. Mixed into a paste. The ingredients are blended and typically chilled before use. Dipping sauce. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Someone in chat said, maybe this is because I'm from Ohio, but that looks good. It does look good. What does being from Ohio have to yeah, fucking what? do with it? What's Ohio got to do with it? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> like, again, like I said if this came up earlier, I'd fuck up this meal. I'd eat it. What does Ohio have to do with anything? <laughs> we eat Skyline Chili? The bar is so low? I don't know what that is. Uh, let me ask my friend Google. In the United Skyline. States, garlic butter is served in small cups, or garlic butter in small cups is sometimes served with seafood, such as lobster, pizza, or breadsticks as a dip. To prolong shelf life, the dip may use clarified butter or flavored oils. Do I have to look this up for myself? Well, hi kitty. Please stop googling new numbers. Kitty! <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna just google Skyline Chili then real quick. Um, apparently the difference is it does not have beans in the sauce. Is that it? That's the only one I can find. It, it's like a chain. It, it's not like a dish, it's like a chain. Ah. Uh, chili with a huge amount of cheese served over spaghetti? It's oh. also quite sweet. Huh. Uh, I found an article on, like, Food and Wine, which is a website I've heard of, uh, written this year. Skyline Chili and Cincinnati Chili in general, explained by a local as best as she can. Uh, the subtitle is Cincinnati Chili was invented a hundred years ago and is extremely tired of your rude comments. First sentence. Skyline Chili is a perfect food and I will tolerate no slander of it. Okay. It... This picture has beans in it, though. So, like, it it just looks like chili that has, like, a lot of raw onions and cheese and, like, oyster crackers and it's on top of spaghetti or hot dogs. Like, it just, it just sounds like, like, odd chili. Uh. This would have to be an entire other segue to read about Skyline Chili. This isn't butter. This isn't butter. I gotta stay on track. <laughs> but. But. A four-way with onions and oyster crackers. Yeah, the, the- Oh, that's- You know, we've been talking about slot meal, this is pile meal. Yeah, this is heat meal. <laughs> oh, that's not your meal, baby. No, this is my meal. I- I gotta be honest, completely honest with you. No, like, no fucking with you, no beating around the bush. Mm -hmm. I want to try this now. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes I, sense to me. I, 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 I need to- I need to try it to believe it. Oh god. What's up? Sorry, my cat just knocked over every single book I own. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> she, she likes to try and climb on top of them. Yo, cheese conies with mustard and french fries? I would eat a fucking chili dog with that on it. I would try that. I would That's eat that. Sonic's meal. It, this is a little bit Sonic meal, isn't it? Little bit. Uh. 
Unique in that it is not chili con carne, the meat dish that originated in and the state dish of Texas. Cincinnati chili is a sauce usually used. So, so it's it's Cincinnati chili. Uh, Mediterranean spiced meat sauce uses a topping for spaghetti or hot dogs. Uh, brown beef, water or stock, tomato paste, spices, just cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, clove, cumin, chili powder, bay leaf, and some home recipes, unsweetened dark chocolate in a soupy consistency. So it's so it's like instead of it being kind of thick, it's like more liquidy soupy. Mm-hmm. Customary toppings include cheddar cheese, onions, and okay. So the onions and beans aren't ingredients in the chili. I knocked over my fucking microphone. Oh god, I'm so sorry. Uh the sheer shock I'm, of I'm Cincinnati like chili. Moving my fucking hands around erratically, like to enunciate when no one can see. It's We can feel it. <laughs> it's it doesn't have beans or onions in it. It has beans and onions added to it afterwards. That's fascinating. Specific combinations of topics are known as ways. <laughs> this is like a fucking martial arts monastic order of chili. <laughs> are you ready to seek the third way? Uh, are you ready, young one? To partake in the next step of the Cincinnati way. <laughs> the most popular order is a three way. Zinger! Which adds shredded cheese to the chili top spaghetti, which is... So a two-way is the chili on top of spaghetti, and the three-way is you add cheese to it, while a four-way or five-way adds onions and or beans before topping with the cheese. Ways are often served with oyster crackers and a mild hot sauce. Almost never served or eaten by the bowl. Fascinating. I won't judge it till I try it. I don't know where or how I would try it. But I won't judge I it till I try. You can put this out on your stoop and summon a Columbo. <laughs> it, it does seem like the kind of chili that Columbo would eat, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, uh, you know this this Cincinnati chili? They they got these ways that they use with it. It's a, it's fascinating. It is. <laughs> Right, the, the sixth way is that you reach heaven. <laughs> <sighs> That's garlic butter, anyhow. Gooey butter cake. Gooey butter cake is a type of cake traditionally made in St. Louis, Missouri. It is a flat and dense cake made with wheat cake flour, butter, sugar, and eggs, typically near an inch tall and dusted with powdered sugar. While sweet and rich, it is somewhat firm and is able to be cut into pieces similarly to a brownie. Whenever I see sweet and rich, like, next to each other, it just reminds me of a fucking thing in a... Uh, I think it was like a Binging with Babish video where he was like, Yeah, and I like this coffee how I like my women, sweet and rich. And I was just like... <sighs> Good joke, I guess, dude. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, uh, it's unrelated, but I have a confession for you. Uh huh. <laughs> Since I got up and came back, I have eaten no less than five donut holes and a spoonful of butter, and I think this might have been a mistake. Pause. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I was paid eight dollars to do so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But <laughs> <laughs> respect, I guess. But <laughs> why? <laughs> I made a solemn vow. She made a vow. Her butter would be found. <laughs> Dairy underground. <laughs> butter ground. Was it good, at least? Oh, these donut holes are great. The butter was butter. (laughs) I'm glad the donuts are good, at least. I ordered way too many of them. I'm starting to think this was a mistake. Just save them for later. They'll they'll, they'll be okay for, like, a little bit. No, I made a vow. Plus, you don't have to eat the whole thing. (laughs) 
You can just put them away for later. <laughs> you you literally said you were making a mistake. <laughs> The bet was for the butter, not the donut holes? What bet? <laughs> what bet? <laughs> I'm having a fucking Alex from Half-Life moment. This is- this is my what cat. for donut holes and said, I'll give this to you if you eat a spoonful of butter, and I said, bet. <laughs> <laughs> I could have just given you donut hole money with no control when it comes to butter specifically for some fucking reason. <laughs> it's because butter's yummy. <laughs> Literally both times. <laughs> oh, okay, first of all, <laughs> I think it's really funny that joke argument we're having, but literally the only argument I can think of that we've ever had is this! <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, both times you've had just the fucking butter by itself, you've said this isn't that great, I regret doing this. What do you mean butter is yummy? <laughs> Listen, eating it by itself by the spoonful is a mistake. Then so why did you do it twice? <laughs> I'm going to hell before I die. <laughs> I gotta be honest, my stomach hurts more now from laughing than from the butter and, and or donut holes. Oh, no! I'm literally like laughing so hard I started crying. <laughs> Don't call him butter gaming nerd! <laughs> They haven't unleashed butter games yet because then my power would be unimaginable. What do you mean, butter games? <laughs> what would it be? I don't know because they haven't released them yet. Oh, uh, Butter Frontiers is coming out soon. The Switch version uh. leaked early. Oh. <laughs> uh. I play Sonic Frontiers and eat a whole stick of butter slowly during the entire thing. We need to stop the stream. <laughs> we need to stop the stream right now. <laughs> we need to. <laughs> Gotta go. Gotta go. <gasps> <laughs> I gotta get up and have a stretch anyways. I'm so sorry for derailing everything like this, genuinely. No, I mean, to be fair, it is butter, so it is still on topic. Still. I'm... You gonna do the same for yourself. We'll be back real soon. I'm gonna run some ads on the way, so you have no excuse. Go get up. Get away from the computer for a bit. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs>
is it? Butter. Butter. A butter bubber. <clears throat> doing bub cake. Bu bubble stream. Doing bur bur burster stream. Hamburger stream. No, no, honey, that's later. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. While sweet and rich, it is somewhat firm and is able to be cut into pieces similar to a brownie. That's where we left off. Gooey butter cake is generally served as a type of coffee cake and not as a formal dessert cake. Two distinct varieties of the cake. The original St. Louis, uh, Mo Baker's Gooey Butter, or sorry, M.O. is probably Missouri, isn't it? The St. Louis yeah, yeah. Missouri Baker's Gooey Butter and a cream cheese and commercial yellow cake mix variant. The original St. Louis Missouri Baker's Gooey Butter is believed to have originated in the 1930s. Made with a yeast raised sweet dough on the bottom. Hey, leech for a brain. Enjoy your new skull. It's yours. The St. Louis Convention Visitors Commission includes a recipe for the cream cheese and commercial yellow cake mix variant cake on its website. Thank you, Tiffany, for the $8. It was such a delight. Thank you for the smiles and laughs, Puzzle 50 Lovebirds, Holly Oh, this lovebirds. is very nice of you to say thank you. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for the tip. Uh, where's my... I am, I'm starting to feel so fucking out of it. There, I, I don't know if I'd be able to stand the humiliation if there was a Butterstream Part 3. <laughs> <laughs> but, like... You can blame it entirely on me, is the thing. D doing a stream that is just several articles, whole articles, all in a row, instead of just the oh. one article, it's just a big list that you can read off of. This is so much more exhausting than that. It really is. My god. My god. Oh. <laughs> uh. Also, if we do a butter stream three, I'm afraid of what people might dare you to do. <laughs> That's entirely fair. I'm starting to think I might have impulse control problems. <laughs> when it comes to butter, I might be inclined to agree at the very least. <laughs> I didn't have to read the articles. I. I'm realizing now that I didn't. No. Huh. Yeah, there was no obligation to. I never, nothing ever said I had to. I just decided I had to. I could just... I could just not. Holly, you're free. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? You mean I have free will? Holly, you had free will all along. The St. Louis Convention and Visitors Commission includes a recipe for the cream cheese and commercial yellow cake mix variant cake on its website, calling it, quote, one of St. Louis' popular quirky foods. The recipe calls for a bottom layer of butter and yellow cake batter, uh, and a top layer made from eggs, cream cheese, and in one case, almond extract. The cake is dusted with confectioner's sugar before being served. The cake is best eaten soon after baking it. It should be served at room temperature or warm. The cream cheese variant of the gooey butter cake recipe, also known as ooey gooey butter cake. <laughs> Fuck off! Occasionally chess cake, while close enough to the original, is an approximation designed for easier preparation at home. Bakeries in the greater St. Louis area are, who are known, uh, who know how to make an original formula gooey butter cake, including those at local grocery chains, Schnucks and Deerbergs. I almost saw it to Diebergs. <laughs> Welcome to my grocery store now, die, fucker. <laughs> Use a slightly different recipe based on corn syrup, sugar, and powdered eggs. However, no cake mix or cream cheese is involved. Origin and popularity. There are several claims to the creation of the cake. The cake was supposedly first made by accident in the 1930s by a St. Louis area German American baker who was trying to make regular cake batter, but reserved the prop reversed the proportions of butter and flour. John Hoffman was the owner of the bakery where the mistake was made. One story is that there were two types of butter, quote, smears used in his bakery a gooey butter and a deep butter. The de deep butter? <laughs> 
We got abyssal butter in this one? <laughs> this is the dark butter, the shadow butter. This is a butter from down below. You can only eat this butter if you're evil and fucked up. This is void butter. The deep butter was used for deep butter coffee cakes, of course. <laughs> The gooey butter was used as an adhesive for things like Danish rolls and stolens. Gooey butter was smeared across the surface, then the item was placed in coconut, hazelnut, peanuts, crumbs, or whatever, so they would stick to the product. Hoffman hired a new baker who was supposed to make deep butter cakes, but got the butter smears mixed up. The mistake wasn't caught until after the cakes came out of the proof box. Rather than throw them away, Hoffman went ahead and baked them. The baking mistakes were made during the Great Depression. Oh, I'm sure they were greatly depressed about this embarrassing butter incident. Which meant supplies for baking ingredients were low. The new cakes sold so well that Hoffman kept baking and selling them. And soon, so did other bakers around St. Louis. Another St. Louis baker, Fred Heimberger, also remembers the cake coming on the scene in the 1930s as a slip-up that became a popular hit and a local acquired taste. He liked it well enough that Mr. Heimberger tried to promote gooey butter cake by taking samples of it with him when he traveled out of St. Louis to visit other bakers in their shops. They liked it, but they couldn't get their customers to buy it. Their reactions leading to regard their reactions tending to regard it as looking uh, too much like a mistake, uh, and quote a flat gooey mess. As such, so it remained a regional favorite for many decades. Other stories surround the cake's creation, none have been historically verified. Gooey butter cake is also commonly known outside of the St. Louis area as ooey gooey butter cake due to popularization by celebrity chef Paula Deen. We have- and the count goes up to two! Paula Deen sighting number two! Soon we're gonna have a Paula Deen sighting every couple of minutes, every couple of seconds. We're gonna start getting two Paula Deens at once. Ugh. Oh. We, we need to close the Paula Deen rift. Paula, uh, do you want to watch Pacific Rim again sometime? I do. I really do. <laughs> like, once or twice a year I just get the I need to fucking watch Pacific Rim urge. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that. Uh... Availability. Many St. Louis era grocery stores sell fresher box gooey butter cakes. Haas Baking sold a widely distributed square and packaged version in a box that depicts a colorful, if anachronistic, scene of aviator Charles Lindbergh's plane in the spirit of St. Louis, uh, or rather, his plane, the spirit of St. Louis, flying past downtown St. Louis, the Gateway Arch, in a modern cityscape in the clouds. Independent family bakeries, or independent or family bakeries, make gooey butter cakes from a time when there were still many neighborhoods cornered German and Austrian American bakeries in St. Louis, neighborhoods like Dutchtown, Beva Mill, and the Tower Grove area, and others. There are now several businesses that specialize in different flavors of gooey butter cake and sell them in coffee shops or to walk in customers or by order or shipment. Panera Bread Company. Original name, St. Louis Bread Company. What? I'm learning about Panera Bread. I'm learning about Panera Bread. <laughs> I'm learning about Panera Bread. <laughs> Makes a Danish with a gooey butter filling for the St. Louis market. More recently, Wow Green sells wrapped individual slices of a version of St. Louis gooey butter cake. Louie gooey! <laughs> Louie ooey gooey! As a snack alongside muffins, yeah, brownies, Scrooge's and cookies. cookies right? Outside of the St. Louis area, as Walmart has been marketing a version called Paula Deen. That's number three. Dear God. Paula Deen baked goods original <laughs> gooey <laughs> butter cake. While Walmart still sells the gooey butter cake, they dropped the Paula Deen version. I was right, seconds apart. Oh no. Polly, Polly, we might have to end the stream for everyone's safety. We gotta get a mech. <laughs> 
We gotta get a Jaeger right fucking now, honey. <laughs> Play the Pacific Rim theme! <laughs> Gooey butter cake, quote, butter cake, is also widely popular in German-style bakeries throughout the Philadelphia metropolitan area, as well as down the Jersey Shore. Wawa. Fucking Wawa. Come on. That's how babies pronounce water. You're fucking with me. Has started selling different flavors of individually wrapped gooey butter cakes. Modern versions of this confection, he originally sold as a breakfast pastry or coffee cake, have shown up on upscale restaurant menus across the Midwest and even the West Coast. In popular culture, on the sci-fi television series Defiance, Nolan and Rafe discuss gooey butter cake while in Old St. Louis in the episode Down in the Ground Where the Dead Men Go. It was featured on an episode of Pizza Master titled Leave Me in St. Louis. Oh. 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 got the Pizza Masters. Not Pizza Masters. I keep fucking dropping shit on the floor. I gotta stop doing that. Well, of course you are! Fucking Pizza Masters are missing! Oh. They're gone. They're gone. What do we do? We need to run. We need to run. We need to leave. We need to reconvene. We need to leave. It's really Pizza Clues. <laughs> the pizza masters have been kidnapped by Paula Bean. Are you a bad enough dude to kiss me with tongue? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go eat butter cake. Hard sauce. I am a hard sauce. I cannot fly, but I am hard. Hard sauce is a sweet, rich dessert sauce made by creaming or beating butter and sugar with rum, brandy, whiskey, sherry, vanilla, or other flavorings. It is served cold, often with hot desserts. Made with Yapaleno. And drink. Butter susu. Army hard sauce. Typically served with plum pudding, bread pudding, Indian pudding, hasty pudding, and other heavy puddings, as well as fruit cakes and ginger. Serve with me and gingerbread. In the UK. Oh, you didn't tell me you were served with hard sauce. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say I didn't tell you I was a fruit cake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did that. I know you know. That was the joke I was gonna make. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in the UK, brandy butter and rum butter are particularly associated with the Christmas and New Year season and Christmas pudding and warm mince pies, serving as a seasonal alternative to cream, ice cream, or custard. At Cambridge, it is also known as Senior Wrangler Sauce! Why? What do you mean? Well, because it's for wrangling the seniors. The Senior Wrangler is the top mathematics undergraduate at the University of Cambridge in England, a position which has been described as, quote, the greatest intellectual achievement attainable in Britain. And all we have for you is this sad sauce of butter whipped with sugar and alcohol? That sounds about right for, like, a mathematics major. You know... No respect. No fucking respect. You know... <laughs> Oh. <laughs> you thought it contained the elderly? Sign! <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> oh, rum butter specifically is typically found in Cumbria and is not common in other regions of the UK. While brandy butter is found nationwide and is more commonplace Christmas accompaniment. Though it is called a sauce, it is neither liquid nor smooth, <laughs> with a consistency more akin to whipped butter 
it. It is a sweet, rich sauce made by creaming or beating butter with a consistency more akin to whipped butter. Go to hell. <laughs> We're in a very interesting part of Butter Stream, I feel. Oh, it's it's been interesting for a while now. <laughs> It is easy to make and keeps for months under refrigeration. It can be pressed into a decorative mold before chilling. Don't mold me, I'm chilling. Under European community regulations to be called rum, brandy, sherry, butter. It must contain at least 20% butter fat. Contents? See also. <laughs> Great. And by the way, it looks like this. Hmm. And by the way, it looks like this. of just buttercream. <laughs> no, it's hard sauce. <laughs> it's completely different. This is just a little this bit buttercream. <laughs> it's just butter with sugar and alcohol. <laughs> it's kind of just buttercream. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. Just for the senior wranglers. Look at a little bit like butt cream, am I right? Hey! Your lungs are so much it. fucking stronger than mine. Holy shit, dude! <laughs> The only reason I let it go is because I started laughing. <laughs> Hollandaise sauce. Formerly also Dutch sauce. Mixture of egg yolk, melted butter, and lemon juice. Or a white wine or vinegar reduction. Usually seasoned with salt and either white pepper or cayenne pepper. Well known as a key ingredient of eggs benedict and often served on vegetables such as steamed asparagus. Puzz is entering her football announcer era! <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Can I do it? Can I do it real quick? Uh, <laughs> as long as it's not too, too loud. Because sometimes the volume peaks a little when you do that. I, I won't do it then. I won't risk it. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> One of these days we'll figure out a solution for your audio setup and then your power will be unleashed. I think it's literally just I need to get a good microphone. <laughs> I mean, that would certainly help, but also good microphones are fucking expensive, so... They are, and I just got this one. I'm getting my fucking money's worth. Like, I I quite like my microphone. I'm very happy with it. I'm dreading the day something happens to it and I have to replace it because it was like a couple hundred dollars, I think. So I'm, I'm yeah, doing, I can't afford that right now. I'm doing my fucking damnedest to take care of it because I need it for my job. 
<laughs> Which is yeah. why I was able to justify the purchase. But that doesn't change it's expensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sauce Hollandaise is a French is French for Hollandic sauce. The name implies Dutch origins, but the actual connection is unclear. The name Dutch sauce is documented in English as early as 1573, uh, though without a recipe showing that it was the same thing. The first documented recipe is from 1651 in La Varenne's Le Cuisinier Francois for asparagus with a fragrant sauce. No, make a sauce with uh, some good fresh butter, a little vinegar, salt and nutmeg, and an egg yolk to bind the sauce. Take care that it doesn't curdle. Not much later in 1667, a similar Dutch recipe was published. There's a popular theory that the name comes from a recipe that French huge nuts brought back from their exile in Holland. <laughs> La Varenne is credited with bringing sauces out of the Middle Ages with his public- OUT OF THE MIDDLE AGES?! <laughs> with his publication, and may well have invented Hollandaise sauce. A more recent name for it is Sauce Isigny, named after Isigny-sur-Mer, which is famous for its butter. Isigny sauce is found in recipe books starting in the 19th century. By the 19th century, sauces had been classified into four categories by Carême. One of his categories was Allemande, which was a stock-based sauce using egg and lemon juice. Escoffier replaced Allemande with egg-based emulsions, including hollandaise and mayonnaise, in his list of the five mother sauces of haute cuisine. While many believe that a true hollandaise sauce should only contain the basic ingredients of eggs, butter, and lemon, uh, a Prosper Montaigne suggested using either a white wine or vinegar reduction, similar to a Bernays sauce, to help improve the taste. In English, the name Dutch sauce was common throughout the 19th century, but was largely displaced by Hollandaise in the 20th. Hi, I have to watch every other butter stream and publication. <laughs> I'm very excited to get to this one soon. I hope you're enjoying Oh, I'm enjoying the butters. Thank you, new type woman, for the 913 sub. Don't worry. The, the previous butter streams in publication order is one of them. <laughs> It's mostly just more of this. <laughs> uh, I've never tried hollandaise sauce. I've heard it's the type of thing where you either really like it or just kind of despise it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know it's like, yeah, this is mostly a thing for like Eggs Benny and stuff, but I've never particularly really wanted Eggs Benedict. Like I could just, I sense. could just as well have, you know, a ham and egg sandwich normal type and put. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like a bit of mayo or hot sauce or something on it instead of making a a, a damn a damn a, a, a bad damn sauce, a damn bad ball sauce. Uh, it's pretty inoffensive. Can't imagine why one might hate it. We're talking about food here. <laughs> have have you seen how people talk about food <laughs> in general? <laughs> love food so much they fucking hate it. <laughs> That's such a funny way of putting that. Thank you, Post Angular. I've gone through the trouble of making hollandaise only once and it was too rich for me. Right, yeah, like it's 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 extremely rich and it's got a type of glossy texture that's like, uh, not everyone's super keen on the mouthfeel, I suppose, you know? It is what it is. Uh... Preparation derivatives, it's not, it's, not as, it's not as important or interesting as learning the history of it. Uh, Karelian pastry. That's a fucking thing from the before times. That's one of them ancient deep sea creatures. This is Anomalocaris to me. Exactly. That's the name of it I was thinking of. That's Anomalocaris, <laughs> my friend. Most sexual motherfucker in the butter stream. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> this is the attack kill of pastries, yeah, Rex. <laughs> Karelian pastries, Karelian pies, or Karelian pierogues. Uh, our traditional pastries are pierogues, originating from the region of Karelia, eaten throughout Finland as well as in adjacent areas such as Estonia and northern Russia. 
The oldest traditional pastries usually had a rye crust, but the North Karelian and Ladoga Karelian variants also contained wheat to improve the quality of the crust. The usual fillings were barley and talcuna. In the 19th century, first potato and then buckwheat were introduced as fillings, and later, boiled rice and millet. Today, the most popular version is a thin rye crust with a filling of rice. Mashed potato and rice and carrot fillings are also commonly available. Butter. <laughs> Butter, by the way. Often mixed with chopped up boiled egg, or egg butter, is spread over the hot pastries before eating. Karyalan Priraka has had traditional specialty guaranteed status in Europe since 2003. This means that any producer not following the traditional recipe cannot call them Karyalan Piraka and instead will have to call them rice pasties, or pasties, potato pasties, etc., depending on the filling. Wait, wait, wait! Hang on. Karyalan Piraka. Don't ever forget it. I forgot to put the music back. <laughs> Queen Amon is a sweet oh, Breton cake made with laminated dough. It's a round, multi-layered cake originally made with bread dough, nowadays sometimes viennoiserie dough containing layers of butter and incorporated sugar similar in fashion to puff pastry. Albeit with fewer layers, the cake is slowly baked until the sugar caramelizes, and the recipe's butter, in fact the steam of the 20% water in the butter, uh, expands the dough, resulting in its layered structure. A smaller version, Queenette, is similar to a muffin-shaped caramelized croissant. A specialty of the town of uh, Duarnenez in fin 
fin Finster Brittany. Finster, isn't that what uh, Chucky's name was in Rugrat? Uh, where it originated around 1860, the, pa the pastry is attributed to Yves René Scordia, 1828 to 1878. He died in a Paraca accident. The name comes from the Breton language word for cake, queen, and butter, aman. And in 2011, the New York Times described the queen aman as, quote, the fattiest pastry in all of Europe. The strict original Duarte's recipe requires a ratio of 40% dough, 30% butter, and 30% sugar. Uh, traditionally, Kuinamon is baked as a large cake and served in slices, although recently, especially in North America, individual cupcake-sized pastries have become more popular. Citation needed. <laughs> Popularity. Every citation needed we've run into today has been very powerful. Yeah! Popularity. The Kuinamon has been a staple pastry at many Japanese bakeries after becoming popular in the late 90s. In 2014, episode 7 of series 5 of the BBC's The Great British Bake Off featured the Kuinamon. In 2015, notable bakeries in New York, Washington, D.C., Boston, Salt Lake City, and San Francisco began to sell the pastry. In Denver, several bakeries offer varieties, some shorten the name to Queen. So I must point out it's completely coincidental that series 5 happens to be the one we've been watching. I think literally the reason why I thought of doing this stream in the first place was because I looked up Queen Amon on Wikipedia and then saw see also list of butter dishes and I was like, oh. So oh, it's no. not so much coincidental as as much as it is the inciting incident. Oh, no, this was my fault all along. <laughs> That's why I wanted you on. <laughs> I also wanted you on because I love you and I like streaming with you, but... <laughs> I was the butter instigator the whole time! <laughs> Linzer Tort is a traditional Austrian, I almost read that word wrong, pastry. Form a shortbread top with fruit preserves and sliced nuts with a lattice design on top of it. It is named after the city of Linz, Austria. Linzer Tord is a very short, crumbly pastry uh, made of flour, unsalted butter, egg yolks, lemon zest, cinnamon and lemon juice, and ground nuts, usually hazelnuts, but even walnuts or almonds are used, covering with a filling uh, of red currant, raspberry, apricot preserves. Australian pastry? No, 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 no. I almost misread it as traditional Austrian pussy. Linzer Tord is a holiday treat in the Austrian, Czech, Swiss, German, and Tyrolean traditions, often eaten at Christmas. Some North American bakeries offer Linzer Tord as small tarts or as cookies. Linzer cookies, German Linzer Ogen, Linzer Eyes, or Linzer Tarts, are a sandwich cookie version. You top with a layer of dough with a characteristic circle shaped cutout of exposing the fruit preserves and dusted with confectioner sugar. Big fan of people in chat going, Oh, pussy! Ah, I see! <laughs> Oh, pussy, I've heard of it. That's pastries, babe! <laughs> <sighs> the Linzer Tort is said to be the oldest cake ever to be named after a place. For a long time, a recipe from 19 1696 in the Vienna Stadt und Landesbibliothek was the oldest known one. In 2005, however, Waltraud Feisner the library director of the Upper Austrian uh, Lands Museum, an author of the book Wiemann de Linzer Drottenmach, How to Make the Linzer Tort, found an even older Veronese recipe. So like clarification needed. From 1653 in Codex 35-31 in the archive of Admont Abbey. The invention of the Linzer Tort is subject of numerous legends, claiming either a Viennese confectioner named Linzer, as given by Alfred Polgar, or the Franconian pastry chef Johann Conrad Vogel, who started mass production of the cake in Linz around 1823. The Austrian migrant Franz Hulshuber claims to have introduced the Linzer Tort to Milwaukee in the 1850s. I like that it's Milwaukee specifically and not like, you know, the United States. No, 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 just Milwaukee. Specifically Milwaukee. They, no one else got it. They don't have delusions of grandeur. They're not gonna come out and say, yeah, I'm the reason why it's in the United States. But Milwaukee? That one is up for the taking. Looks cool. Milwaukee? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
raisin au raisin. Pain au raisin. Sure, if you want to pronounce it like a fucking Parisian. Gustave de Laval. There we uh, go. Also called escargot or pain russe is a spiral pastry often eaten for breakfast in France. Its name translates as raisin bread, snail, and Russian bread, respectively. It is a member of the Patisserie Viennoise family of baked foods. In French, it is typically a variant of the croissant or pain au chocolat, made with a leavened butter pastry with raisins added and shaped in a spiral with a creme patisserie filling. Uh, however, in many areas of Northern Europe and North America, it is generally made with sweetened bread dough, or brioche dough, again almost misread as bionicle, rather than pastry. It is often consumed for breakfast or as part of a continental breakfast. In Paris, the name pain au raisin is also used for a type of raisin bread, loaf of bread made from wheat or rye and stuffed with raisins. I've never had this style uh, of, of raisin bread. I've had just like the, you know, normal ass loaf of bread with raisin and cinnamon and stuff in it, but... Sounds good. I like a baked treat with raisin and cinnamon. Yeah. Oh, this make me want like a nice raisin swirl bread. Fucking Pajarski cutlet again? We we did our time. We're not going back. <laughs> we did that. You can rewind a chicken Kiev if you want the Pajarski cutlet update. Popcorn. Popcorn, also called popped corn, popcorns, or pop dash corn is a variety of corn kernel which expands and puffs up when heated. The same names also refer to the foodstuff produced by the expansion. A popcorn kernel's strong hull contains the seed's hard, starchy endosperm, uh, shell endosperm, with 14-20% to 20 moisture, uh, which turns to steam after the kernel is heated. Pressure from the steam continues to build until the hull ruptures, allowing the kernel to forcefully expand uh, 20 to 50 times its original size, and then cool. Some strains of corn, taxonomized as Zia maize, are cultivated specifically as poppin' corns. The Zia maize variety Iverta, a special kind of flint corn, is the most common of these. You can eat it with butter. It explodes. This is... This would be a really interesting article to read through if I wasn't about to fucking pass out. Save it for the popcorn stream, I guess. What does that mean? <laughs> Help. I don't understand the question. <laughs> Help me! <laughs> Puff pastry! You know about fucking puff pastry, come on! Don't fuck with me tonight! <laughs> <laughs> Remember that the number of layers in puff pastry is calculated with the formula. Uh, where L is the number of finished layers, F is the number of folds in a single folding move, and uh, uh, N is how many times the folding move is repeated. Remember that puff pastry has been mathematically solved. I need you to know that as soon as I saw there was an actual mathematical formula on this page, I started literally quivering in fear. Why? I'm scared of formulas. They make my brain confused. <laughs> oh, well, maybe this is just because of how I play the fucking games, but formulas just make me think of Leighton now. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why we play them together. So, so, so that I can protect you from the scary bits? <laughs> yeah. The scary parts of Professor Leighton. <laughs> I have feelings for you. Likewise, my love. Romance is a cake filling paste used in various traditional Danish pastries. Creaming softened butter with sugar, sometimes flavored with cinnamon, uh, e.g. in cinnamon snails, cardamom, custard, mozipan, or almond paste. Always baked along with the pastry. It is a Danish word and invention. In English language, it has been referred to as Lord Mayor Filling. I gotta stop fiddling. Oh, with I thought you were doing that on purpose for emphasis. No, I keep doing that because I'm a fucking klutz and I don't know hey. to like put things down because nice. I like fiddling with things. Nice. <laughs> okay. You guys, I'm gonna come fucking get you. You love hearing Holly roll her dice. I have good or bad news for you. It's not a pair of dice. Do you want to know what it is? Uh, it is a set of standoff screws that I had to uninstall that I was previously using to hold down, uh, my, my CPU cooler that died. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> these are whole ass screws on my desk that I can't bring myself to part with because they have a cool shape. <laughs> and you never know when you might need a screw. These are not like traditional screws. These are not screws I can use for anything else except that one specific model of CPU cooler, which is now dead. <laughs> yeah, you never know when you might need them. <laughs> You know what I might need them for? There might be a home invasion and I need a pair of crudely cobbled together brass knuckles to beat them to death. Exactly! <laughs> That's when I might need them. <laughs> That's why you gotta keep them around, just in case. Also, I keep them around because they're cool to have. So that's, exactly. <laughs> that's the real Even gist better. of it. <laughs> What the fuck is torpedo dessert? We finally get to learn. A torpedo dessert is a buttery, flaky viennoiserie bread roll filled with pastry cream made for its well-known torpedo shape. Croissants and other viennoiserie are made of a layered yeast-leavened dough. The dough is layered with butter, rolled and folded several times in succession, then rolled into a sheet in a technique called laminating. The process results in a layered, flaky texture similar to a puff pastry. This is just a fucking cream horn. What's a cream horn? It It's like a cannoli, but with more of a whipped cream inside instead of like a cheesy inside. Cannoli's got cheese inside? It It's like kind of a, I believe it's a goat cheese type filling. It's kind of like a, think like a cheesecake, except like light and fluffy. How have I never fucking had a cannoli all my life? Holly, I'm going to get you a cannoli, baby. Okay. <laughs> Ricotta, that's the cheese, thank you. Tiffany, enjoy your new skull. <laughs> I need to come fucking visit you, Liz. I'm sure there's plenty of good food around where you live. I I've been wanting to come out and visit my sister. <laughs> but you know Go visit your sister and get fed! I should, but travel is scary in plague times. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, one of these days. One of these days. That's... List of butter dishes. Here's a picture of a layer cake with buttercream icing. Here's a butter tart. Here's butter tea. I still think the butter tea might be the most legitimately interesting one we hit. Yeah, it's neat. Here's egg butter. Here's croissant. I didn't finish the croissant article. I guess I'm just not. Unless... You during pastry stream. I mean, list of pastries is... Like an actual list that I can hit up and not murder myself reading. Exactly. So, I... I don't know if I'm gonna end up going to the croissants in that one. But... <laughs> Wait a second. Wait a second. Uh-huh. Butter chicken. Butter chicken. It's not on the list. Why isn't it on the list? It's not on. Times look. Are you going to eat that croissant? It's not on the list. Um. Yes. Are you going to finish that croissant? Ah. Uh, uh, yes. I'll have one more, and then that'll be it. It's. It's not on- it's- butter chicken! It's on the page! It's a butter dish! It's- it's pictured here! It's not on the list! Why didn't they put it on the list? Secret DLC butter! It's not on the list! Holly, do, do we have a protocol for this? We gotta go.